What's good, y'all? Welcome back to the Onyx Report. Hope everybody is well. Um, man, you know, time is moving, trying to get it together. Uh, we are broadcasting tonight on several different platforms. We are back on innerlightradio.com. Uh, we are also on YouTube. We are also on Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, and um, what's the other one? Twitch. Although LinkedIn keeps keeps turning my, they keep kicking my videos off for some strange reason. They don't really like me, I guess. <laughs> Nevertheless, uh, welcome back to the Onyx Report, where we as Black male justice advocates uplift Black men and boys using critical analysis. A um, couple things, actually not a lot. We're going to, we're going to, you know, just kind of cover a couple of quick things before we get into it. But let me first start by on <laughs> Sorry about that, um, uh, but I appreciate that, Solis. Thanks for the support. Let me first start honoring um, my subscribers as follows. All right. Much appreciation to my supporters. Um, yeah. Now let me start with the things that uh, we got to cover just to get the, the, the basic stuff out of the way. Right. You guys know what it is. Support the Onyx Report. Um, like, share, uh, subscribe, join and donate. Uh, if you would support the channel so we can grow and we can develop. Um, it, you know, we're still trying to get it going. I am near 21,000 subs. I would like to get higher than that, but it has been a slow process. So I'm working on it and I'm hoping you guys will help. Here you can see on YouTube, if you click the subscribe button, there are different levels of membership you can, you can engage in, different types of perks, or you can go ahead and go over to Patreon and support monthly through Patreon. Uh, you can support the Onyx Report or you can support the Institute for Black Male Studies. So please make sure you consider doing so so we can continue to do this work, All right? Okay, so let me see, looking at it, we got a few people coming in. We got about 46 so far. Hit the like button on your way in. Uh, I see Jave Cleveland. Uh, I see Todd Muhammad, what's going on, good brother? Uh, Great I-9, uh, Joe Average brother. A um, few people in here, Ishmael, JJ, Atlanta Stay. Um, can't tell what that is so i hope you get that uh brother malika always good to see you um barry what's up you know taylor always good to have you javon you know we in here so thank you guys for for coming in i apologize not a lot of you know advertisement uh for a lot of my videos lately i've just been kind of you know drive by pop up you know kind of doing my thing but hey it is what it is. Um, it is the beginning of the semester. You know, I am teaching as well as, uh, you know, trying to cover being up here. So it is what it is. But uh, anyway, thank you for supporting. You know, I was just actually watching a really good movie that I do plan to continue watching from the bathtub after the show. As some of you, you guys know, I am very, very addicted to my new bathtub. So I'm about to enjoy that after we done here. A movie called, uh, here we go. Ah, here we go. Yeah, it's called The Man From Earth. Real interesting flick. I'm into sci-fi. So about a man who's lived for 14,000 years. And uh, I am actually digging the philosophical implications of the dialogue that he's having. Uh, with the friends he's decided to tell about that so i've just been in a real kind of zen space checking that out but anyway i wanted to kind of cover real quick before we jump in tonight um 
just one quick um, piece that I think merits some acknowledgement. And the irony is I can't tell if it's true or not. Mike Ferguson, much appreciation. Uh, thank you for supporting the show. I hope you guys will take some direction from Mike and do that as well. Um, you know, I'm trying to put a, a kid through college soon. He's, oof, man, he's a junior. This is his last semester of junior year, man. My baby is six foot nine and almost ready to start his senior year. And I can still, I can still see when I can hold him in one hand, you know, it's a trip. It really is a trip. It felt like a minute ago, you know, damn, yeah. I remember him coming out and now he's towering over me. His hands are bigger than mine <laughs> and it just blows me away. So anyway, I'm a little bit sentimental tonight, but nevertheless, uh, help me, uh, you know, support the show. But this is, uh, you know, our sacred black masculine series. You guys know what it is. For those who listen to the show, we celebrate black men and boys over here, as well as use what we can to uplift them. And today's article I'm not, I honestly couldn't say if it's, if it's true or if it isn't, um, if it is, then kudos to those involved. If it isn't, then we'll take it as a lesson and hopefully be inspired by, um, its direction, you know? So let's see here. All right. M Johnston, appreciate that support. Um, so some of you guys may have seen this image on social media, um, it's across my feed a little while ago, and it comes from a piece, uh, that's actually in a Hindi, it's on a Hindi website, right? Hindi virals it says no one came to students graduation. So his teacher took him out to dinner and bought him a car, right? Uh, it reads every student looks forward to graduation day. It's the icing on the cake of one's su success the formal conclusion of a major stage in the educational process, a watershed moment in one's life. As a result, we all wish to enjoy this memorable occasion with our loved ones. One Alabama, Alabama adolescent, however, was not so fortunate. Dominic Moore, a Bessemer City High School teacher and graduate uh, graduation organizer was cleaning up after the ceremony in mid-June when he saw one of his pupils. After everyone else had departed, the student was sitting alone. Moore claimed he sensed something was wrong since he knew his pupil well. When he inquired about the, his family or friends, the, the youngster simply replied, nobody's here. Moore left after assuring his pupil that everything will be okay, since he expected tremendous things from him. However, when he returned later, he discovered that no one had arrived to take up the youngster as he had expected. Uh, he volunteered to drive the student. He inquired whether he was hungry in the car, and the adolescent advised eating wings from a popular restaurant. Moore, on the other hand, desired to visit a specific location the child recommended the Cheesecake Factory, which he had never visited before. Adolescent ate shrimp basket, uh, ate a shrimp basket with fries and an Oreo cheesecake while wearing his graduation hat. Moore, a Bessemer um, City High School alumni, attempted not to be too emotional throughout the lunch, didn't ask any questions, and wanted to make the youngster feel valued for his achievements. I can't picture graduating from high school without my parents present. At the time, all I wanted to do was graduate him. It was a fantastic experience. Despite this, he acknowledged to holding back tears at lunch. The youngster landed a job at Amazon just hours after graduation. Moore took him there because he didn't have a way to get to his new job. At the conclusion of the day on June 18th, Moore did something he had never done before. He shared the tale on Facebook. Uh, these are uh, typical occurrences for me and I deal with them on my own. Uh, when you do anything, you don't necessarily have to show or tell everyone but this one didn't sit right with me. I'm not sure what that was, he says. In case anyone wanted to aid the youngster, he included the Cash App account in the message. As of June 19th, more than $5,000 had been given. Moore accompanied the youngster to a bank after work to create a checking account. They placed the majority of the money into the cashier's into a cashier's check until they could locate uh, the teens, uh, some dependable transportation. Moore hopes the youngster will be able to save money to go to college in the future. Uh, he remarked nine days after he launched the fundraiser, it's astounding to me that so many have blessed him in this way. He's gotten a large sum of money, which is, you know, which he's been given, um, which he has given to a financial counselor. 
He's overjoyed. No, you will not cry in front of me. I responded as he's about to cry. They're both appreciative uh, for other people's charity. And this virtuous uh, instructor concluded that although we have evil, it indicates that mankind is wonderful in this moment. What a fantastic story. Now, again, I have no idea if this is true, but I share it because whether it is or it isn't, it definitely highlights the type of support we need to make sure we give most particularly to young black men who are likely to not find very much support in general. Um, brothers that listen to my channel can speak from life experience about how often people have volunteered help, affirmation, care, support. Y'all know what it is. So find ways to support those around you, those who need it. And I talked about this a couple of shows ago where I was saying that at the end of the day, black men are going to have to start advocating for one another because there are so many areas where we're finding that nobody else does. And opposed to, you know, as opposed to competing with one another or tearing each other down, there's got to be a point where we support one another. And I hope by the end of tonight, you'll have yet another reason to do so. Because some of the things we're talking about or we will be talking about are, are pretty, pretty serious, you know, pretty heavy. Um, but the information is incredibly important, um, you know, so we need to go ahead and do it. Now, as you could tell, right, the title of tonight's show is um, pretty telling, right? How white feminists stole civil rights. Now, that is a very truncated approach to the topic, which you'll see why. And, it's, and this is called a part two. And the reason it's called a part two is that if you missed it, uh, and you may have, because uh, my good brother posted this on uh, one of his channels, that he doesn't tell all of us about very often, but anyway. Um, and so he covered something that I think is quite important. And I think it only fair that I ask him to come up and we talk about this because after watching the video and reading the work it refers to, it, it definitely needs to be covered and supported in a larger uh, context. So let me go ahead and bring up Brother BGS. What's up, man? BGS, Doc, can you hear me? Yeah, what's up, Doc? Uh, hold on. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, okay. Turn your mic up a little bit. I think it's tied to uh, some of my super chat ring so i think that's what <laughs> okay yeah i'm gonna have to split that apart but my sound has been acting real weird uh can you hear me okay hey yeah which is jarvis is not acting right huh eh, i shouldn't complain while i'm while i'm relying on him but uh <laughs> you know <laughs> but man i wanted to salute you man you, the piece you put up earlier this week was was beautifully done um, and if you would, you know, I let everybody know this is, I'm considering this a part two. Okay. Considering this a part two, because what you did was, 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 it was beautifully handled. If you would tell people what you did, what channel you put it on and what it was about. Uh, actually I have a books channel, uh, where I put some, you know, uh, more, uh, we'll say mundane work that's, that's, uh, not as popular. That's what it's for. So it's more, uh, it's, it's less about entertainment. It's more about uh, books and papers and stuff like that. And the reason I put it, this particular work on the books channel is because um, the last couple of times that I've actually done, uh, put Dr. Curry's work on my channel, I got strikes for it. So, so, so the books channel is probably my smallest channel. So I said, okay, if I'm going to get a hit for it, it's never been hit before, get a hit for it. I'm actually going to put it on a channel that can afford actually 40 hit. <laughs> because my main channel, you know, I get at least two strikes a year. Damn. So it, it it wasn't to bury it, you know, it, it wasn't to bury the uh, the the uh, work. It was actually to actually protect the other two channels. Yeah. So yeah. and this and this was going to be incendiary, you know, um, just by by mentioning about, about white feminists or feminism period can be incendiary, mm -hmm. and uh, you you match that with uh, Tommy Curry's name, you know that that can get kind of explosive. So that's why I put it there. <laughs> Yeah, but right. the books channel, but the books channel is, you know, it's it's a small channel. I don't post it very often, but when I'm actually going to dig into a book that's going to be kind of dry and more um, academic, that's where I put it. So that's okay. why it's not that big. I don't post there, you know, post there very often. 
Now, I didn't deviate from the title very mm -hmm. much on purpose because I mm -hmm. want to actually go check out the original video. So I think mm -hmm. it's less than 15 minutes. Uh, kind of, you know, and, hit it pretty and, quick. And people love the thumbnail. <laughs> With the hey, white female Grinch. With the Grinch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's what caught my eye before I read the title. I was like, what the hell is this? And then uh, by the time I saw it, I said, oh, man, I got to. So I checked it out a few times. And then, you know, and, and as you and I discussed, I was already reading the paper, mm. but I just was moving slow because I was doing a bunch of different stuff. And and so by the time I finished your review, I was like, oh, snap. I didn't realize the completed argument because I hadn't gotten there yet. <laughs> so, mm. you know, I, so I had to go back and finish it. But the title of Dr. Curry's paper is Feminism as Racist Backlash, Understanding How the Will to Dominate Black Americans Drove the Development of 19th and 20th Century Feminist Theory. Mm -hmm. and I communicated with Dr. Curry, he gave me permission to cover this because the paper has not, uh, I don't think it's been published yet. You know, he's, he's got it up on academia, uh, which he tends to do with all his papers. So you can, you can keep up with Dr. Curry's work there. Um, but you know, uh, this is a beautifully done piece. Uh, he's still he's still polishing, I would imagine, uh, here and there. But it's 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 done quite well, as is usually the case with him. So it's no mm -hmm. surprise. But he's always bringing something that pushes us to the next level. And so, um, if you would talk a little bit uh, before we get into the paper itself, talk a little bit about what inspired you to make it a video. Why? Uh, because it's something that I have been saying for a long time, and people have hinted at it that um that affirmative action uh we didn't in other words we didn't get the full uh brunt of, of affirmative action we didn't get the full value from affirmative action or civil rights mm -hmm. and and black people have been saying that since the 70s because i first uh noticed that when i first went to college right they were talking about the baki decision mm -hmm. and how the uh how the, the supreme court had kind of uh blunted a lot of uh, the affirmative action or the equal opportunity that uh, was actually had come through uh, the civil rights. That's when I first noticed it. And as you, as we wound gone along, the the, the uh, you know the uh, the effect of affirmative action has gotten less and less and less and less. And but the thing, it took me a while to figure it out, even though it's right in front of our faces. I remember watching Good Times, and uh, they talk about the black woman being the double minority, being mm -hmm. a, being a, a black woman and and a, and a black female. And uh, and how the uh, black males are getting left out of the affirmative action pie, even though, you know, basically they're the ones that actually fought for it. They're the ones that, you know, uh, got out in the streets and actually rioted for it. And then uh, on the other end, you don't even get 10 uh, percent of the pie. Yeah. And as you as you go along, um, I've been saying for years that the biggest beneficiary of affirmative action were actually white women. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And what Dr. Curry does in this piece is he actually explains how that came about right. and, and, and why. And the interesting thing about it is, and, and he reiterates this toward the end of the paper as well, it's not even something that you can discuss as an academic without mm -hmm. blowback, without right. serious blowback, which is one of the things that brought me to, uh, you know, to, to not only YouTube, but even, mm -hmm. uh, even just doing, you know, content online. Yeah. It's just because I got tired of the constipated nature of, uh, you know, academic discussions as it pertained to black men. And anything you said that went out of some very, you know, strict kind of boundaries mm -hmm. was immediately received with hostility, you know, with intense hostility. If you violated the, the boundaries of what people thought you should mm -hmm. talk about in regard to black men, especially if you challenged some of the sacred ideas Mm -hmm. that we're supposed to hold dear uh, as intellectuals. Right? Yeah. Without, without, without this background, there is no Title IX. Okay? Mm -hmm. Without this background, there is no Planned Parenthood. All this stuff was actually, uh, you know, came out of this uh, putting uh, sex into Title VII. Yeah. Yeah. Um, real quick, shout out to J.H. Booth for the support. Shout out to Troy West. Appreciate that support. Also, Kevin, uh, appreciate the cash app. Thank you. Um, so let's start uh, at the beginning. Uh, so we're, we, you know, you, you decided to cover this piece because yeah. it really kind of, you know, aligned with some things you were thinking about. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, of course, for me, this has been an ongoing, you know, question uh, as to the details. We had the broad, broad strokes. Mm -hmm. you know, we kind of had a broad, the broad strokes in terms of the interruption and the appropriation 
of the momentum that civil rights had pushed and the ways that that was, you know, kind of taken out. And one of the things I've been using uh, to reference that is Dr. Bobby Wright. And Dr. Bobby Wright has a piece on YouTube, a short video clip from the 1980s, where he talked a little bit about that, the ways in which, you know, the, this, you know, kind of momentum uh, with civil rights that was rolling into black power, was right. kind of appropriated by these feminists. But right. he was talking about it from the vantage point of black feminism in the black community and the right. way in which it had kind of just, you know, this it was a, you know, kind of a detour. Mm -hmm. But uh, Dr. Curry is approaching this differently. How would you frame uh, Dr. Curry's approach? Uh, Dr. Curry actually talks, you know, uh, we talk about uh, it socially, okay? But black feminists and what they do is is not structural. It's, so, it's social, right? What Dr. Curry does, he actually talks about it from a structural uh, political standpoint, okay? In other words, this is legislation, Okay, mm -hmm. this is purposeful le legislation, right? By one, just by putting in one word, you take change the whole uh, uh, framework, the whole language of the whole civil rights um, legislation. Okay, yeah. the thing is, God, I always wondered how did white women get into uh, become a minority? Okay, who mm -hmm. made them a minority? How did they uh, attain uh, civil rights status when they weren't uh, a oppressed okay they never went through jim crow and slavery they uh they never uh they never really were were um how can i say um discriminated in the workplace okay right. They, right. They, they they because of their white skin okay um so how did how did they get put like like uh how did they get their gucci boots over the the, the, the offensive oppression and who allowed them to do it Mm -hmm. And that had never been uncovered, even though, you know, you can you can see it in the legislation when they as he wrote Title seven, that sex was put in there. I said, well, why would they put sex in there? And mm -hmm. then later on, when uh, uh, President Johnson put uh, sex in his uh, uh, in, 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 in his uh, in his uh, presidential signings, right, in his executive orders. Mm -hmm. OK, I said, how did that get in there? Because, it, you know, even the feminists know, OK, if you put sex in there, who's the first person in line? Right. And Dr. Curry actually in his work says the liberals, even the feminists knew that. That if you put it in there, the bulk of the legislation, the bulk of the remedies going to actually equalize uh, 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 black people in, 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 the, in a dominant society is going to get sidetracked because women are going to take the bulk of it. Right. Even uh, in, in the in the feminist book, more than Title Nine, they actually said that they said they knew uh if if they if they got or were allowed into um, affirmative action, allowed affirmative action, and allowed civil rights the same way black people are, the first people in line are going to be white people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Now, what what I think look because I think at the end of the day, in order to be you know given uh, you know proper justice, um, mm -hmm. we need to see Dr. Curry present this himself, and I don't think he's had a chance to yet because this is brand new. Right. This is fresh off the press. So I, I, not, I shouldn't even say press, fresh off his computer, I imagine. Mm -hmm. uh, so if he has presented it, I don't know. I haven't seen that yet. But what I want to do is, you know, and, and I think we could trade off here. If there are any choice sections you might want to read a sentence or two from, we can let Dr. Curry's voice kind of lead the discussion a little bit. Uh -huh. and, you know, and I'll say now this is a this is a fairly extensive work, but he, he's broken it up into four major parts. Right. We're really emphasizing part the last four. part, the last part, because he, he yeah. he's, he's you know, because the whole paper is about um, feminism is not the feel good, inclusive um, right. ideology that right. it's been portrayed to be. You know, right. feminism has been racist from the very start. Right. Mm -hmm. Feminism is actually an elitist, racist uh, ideology. It has been from the very start because uh uh, well, that's why I come. I had uh, uh, Green Gorilla actually go back and look at the roots of it, which comes from uh, uh, the French Revolution and Rousseau's rights of men, right? Mm -hmm. And what the elite white women wanted—they, they, they didn't. Number one, they didn't want the the common man to get rights that they didn't have. Mm -hmm. You know, they were they were kind of okay with uh, the elite men, the elite landowners, the rich, the the, the uh, educated elite class, uh, males having. Uh, first shot at it, right? Been mm -hmm. ruled over, as long as they could be second in command. But they were not 
happy with the common man and especially not happy with black men who were former slaves being allowed stuff that they didn't have. Yeah. They immediately went from being abolitionists to being feminists and anti-black male, especially. Well, let me do it this way. Go ahead. Uh, I'm going to start. I do want to read the very first paragraph of the introduction and I'm going to share that with people. Um, hold on. Do you have it? I do apologize if you guys can't see it. Well, I have my, my computer is, uh, you know, I tend to keep it in Batman mode, so everything is <laughs> in dark <laughs> you know, mode, huh? That's right, dark mode. Um, but nevertheless, uh, again, the title is Feminism as Racist Backlash, Understanding How the Will to Dominate Black Americans Drove the Development of 19th and 20th Century Feminist Theory. And I should say, he's been building on this in a number of papers he's done in the last year, exploring the origins of feminism. So this mm -hmm. doesn't come wholly out of nowhere. It comes out of a developing argument that he's been working on for quite a while. Mm -hmm. But as you see, it reads quite often, the more popular an idea becomes, the harder it is to question the rise of the idea. Introducing skepticism or questioning the pro propagandist aspects of what has become a cherished idea, a belief thought to be obvious or intuitively correct is often seen as heresy. Feminism has become such a belief. Okay? Over the last several decades, the history of white women's rights movements and its leaders. Okay, whatever you eat, man, you're making everybody hungry. Okay. <laughs> it's actually water, but I'm no, oh, sorry. Okay. Now I'm ready to eat. Anyway, feminism has become such a belief. Over the last several decades, the history of white women's rights movements and its leaders have become increasingly increasing descri described, in, I guess increasingly described as not only influenced by racism but intimately committed to the preservation and imperial projection of white supremacy. For example, the historian Luis Newman has argued that racism was not just an unfortunate sideshow in the performances of feminist theory. Rather, it was center stage, an integral constitutive element in feminism's overall understanding of citizenship, democracy, political self-possession, and equality. Uh, Right. Rather than being a generative critique of the racist legacy suffragists, segregationists, and the competing political ideologies of 20th century America, much of the interpretive fervor given to the racism of American feminism has focused on the historical failing of integrating Black women into the feminist movement and the contemporary absence of intersectionality amongst white women. Right? The explanation of feminism's failures have been articulated as failures of inclusion the exclusion of black women. Little to no research has evaluated the cost of feminism, uh, feminism's racist caricatures and political appeal to white supremacy to black men. Any thoughts about that, brother? That is that is that in in a nutshell. Okay. <laughs> that is that in a nutshell. If you understand um the ideas behind um what feminism is actually about, the fundamental idea was feminism was actually about giving the uh, wh white women equal footing with white men mm -hmm. and, and 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 basically uh them being uh the same as white men that's that's what it is and they and, and thing is them being the same as white men they also adopted what what white men thought which is um their um how can i say the uh uh uh, their ideology would, that they're going to actually rule together. They want to be co-rulers. Mm. Mm. Well, not and, and definitely so. But I think mm -hmm. one of the interesting parts about this particular segment, mm -hmm. and if there's anything you want me to put on screen, let me know. No, go ahead. No. But the, but the interesting thing about this segment is he's starting out real, you know, straightforward in regard to how we understand feminism, mm -hmm. what we assume its roles to be. Right. And the way it's discussed, and I thought this was incredibly important, because building up to, you know, some of the arguments he makes later, he starts by pointing out that the way we interpret the history of feminism mm -hmm. is, is we give these kind of, you know, these brief acknowledgments to early suffragettes and their, and their uh, you know, their racism. And, and, and we frame that in terms of how they excluded black women and, yes. and whatnot. But again, no connection to black men. And I think the prevailing kind of underlying idea, and this goes to what I call flat, you know, flat maleness, is this idea on one level or another that men are men and men are privileged because they're men. Right. Mm -hmm. And so by the time you start to talk about black men having the right to vote, 
Right. The idea is that they're going to join the ranks of white men and oppressing women, right? Or at least this was the idea sold to black women because mm-hmm. black men are inherently, you know, you can fit stereotype here, you know? So that being said, if they get the right to vote, they're going to be above white women. They're going to join white men, right. and all women. And mm-hmm. that's going to be a, a recipe for disaster for black women. Ergo, the need for this kind of feminist sisterhood. Yeah. Right? I think this is where he's he, he's he's laying the framework for how uh, much of 19th century feminism is kind of framed. And, and it continues to evolve from there, because obviously, as feminism begins to petition women of color, uh, women of different uh, sexual orientations, it gives the impression that feminism is evolving into an entity uh, that is, you know, uh, you know, justice oriented, inclusive, inclusive yeah. and mm-hmm. right. But he goes into a different direction, right? He starts talking about feminism as actually uh, a part of white patriarchy, and there were there's some other works he's dealt with that more. He's dealt with that you know more intensely. But the idea that feminism doesn't come to break from white patriarchy, it is you know a constitutive part of white patriarchy. In other words, I think you actually described. I think we had this discussion a while back. Mm -hmm. We did. Is is that uh, feminism is the evolution of, of white patriarchy? but it's a part of white supremacy. Right. It's, and that's absolutely right. And, and that's why at the end of the Civil War, when this question of voting comes up, mm-hmm. it, it really kind of lays bare, or at least it gives uh, feminist propo- fem- feminism's proponents the opportunity mm-hmm. to l- lay bare what their real ori- their orientation is, what their real motives are. Mm-hmm. And what they begin to argue, according to Dr. Curry, is that um, they themselves are the best accompaniment to white men. Yes, yes. They yes. are the best accompaniment. And if, if in fact if white men do not allow them the position that is that they, that is warranted, you know, yes. as far as they're concerned, it's gonna mean the downfall of the white race. That, that's what they believe, yeah. They they, mm-hmm. they believe that uh, uh white women uh, should be co rulers. Yes. Of the whole entire planet. Absolutely. The, the, well, the old whole part of manifest destiny. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's why uh, Dr. Curry says we're going to, you know, uh, uh, white women were willing to play their part to so that the white men could actually conquer the world so they can evolve to a different state, which is the state of what we call equity now, Mm -hmm. which is why um, even though a black woman starts uh, uh, something like Me Too, it's appropriated. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's for white women to sit at the table next to white men. It's not for black women to be included. Mm hmm. Or black men to be included. It's it's and they only talk about ruling. They don't talk about jobs and in in, in 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 careers or opportunities. They talk about uh, uh, me too means I need to be uh, uh, fifty percent of the CEOs. Mm-hmm. I need to be fifty percent of the decision makers. Right. I need fifty percent of the business owners. Okay, right. they don't talk about making black men, uh, uh, helping black men to become business owners, or even white black women to become business owners. Okay, and even uh, even in, if you read further down in Dr. Curry's paper, uh, he, what he says is that uh, black men are too savage to be be husbands and partners to black women. It'd be better for uh, the white black women to be servants of, or a concubine of of uh, white men rather than to be savaged by black men. They say black men are not worthy to be husbands and partners to black women. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So and, and, and so this this kind of as 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 Nicole Young these tropes and these sentiments and these archetypes continue still to this day. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yep. And- and that's kind of, I mean, there are, you see changes over the last century, but the changes mm-hmm. still have an underlying logic that is consistently, uh, you know, pushing mm-hmm. for a hierarchy that, that's as old as, you know, we've seen it going back yeah. to the, you know, the formation of, yeah. oh, go ahead. Yeah, even Bell Hooks said that, the, you know, that it was racist for white men not to marry black women. Mm-hmm. Bell Hooks says that the proper spot of a black woman is to be married to white men. Hundreds mm. of years later, she wrote that in the book "Ain't Our Woman." Mm. Well, <laughs> uh, I mean, that, that's a mic drop. There ain't, there's nothing. There's no to that. I'm, I'm not in disagreement. I'm like, yeah. 
pretty much how that's perceived, right? Um, but, you know, I, and I want to lead up to it with a little bit of the subculture of violence. But before we get to that, you know, there are mm-hmm. just some, some choice quotes that I think, uh, you know, are good mm-hmm. to reflect the on. Please share, yeah. To, to develop that. So, um, let me see. Here's uh, another. And again, this is, this, is, this is still something he's polishing. Um, mm-hmm. And I appreciate him allowing us to kind of go through it. Um, you know, but uh, let me see here. Which one do I want to jump into? This One of the problems I had with this is, you know, when you start highlighting, mm-hmm. it took everything in me not to highlight every everything. single word yeah. and every single paragraph. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what, 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 what is more important than the next line, right? You have to... <laughs> You had to make decisions. Even right. I, I ran through that. What that's what Tommy is pretty dense as, as far as uh, one thing I say about Tommy, uh, he does it. He, he really doesn't. Uh, he really he really economizes words. He doesn't really waste words. Okay, he doesn't make flowery sentences or right. give flowery examples. Every every sentence to Tommy means something. Right. Absolutely. And that and so you end up. And this is what I said to him when I interviewed him on my show. I said when I read your work. It's, it, by the time you get to the end of it, it's it's like being at a restaurant and getting pissed off at the chef because the meal is done mm-hmm. and you didn't want to finish it. You, mm-hmm. you, you're mad that there wasn't more and you wish you could go back to the beginning of the night where you were just sitting down and the plate was just being served. You know, it's almost like you wish you didn't read it just so you could read it again. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, but let me see. So let me pop into uh, one of his uh, when, when, at the point where he's talking about the violence of feminism, mm. which I think mm-hmm. is incredibly important. Oh, yeah. Yes. He's talking about, he says, the violence of feminism, its pursuit of imperialism, its violence and criminalization of black men and other racialized males, its demand for segregationist logics to protect womanhood have not been properly pursued by black theorists in such a way that it has become part of dominant historiography. Despite black males being the group spe- specifically targeted by white suffragettes during the debates over the 15th Amendment and by women's rights groups who feared engaging a public filled of free black men who were thought to be rapists. Now, this is incredibly important because one of the things, aside from kind of, you know, giving a side eye uh, to black theorists who don't go far enough in this framing of how we understand feminism, one of the things he highlights very directly, right, is is, uh, white women's approach to the 15th Amendment, their perceptions about it and the ways that they use black men as the framework to argue mm-hmm. against it, you know, to make an argument about where they should fit. Right. Exactly. In the narrative. Mm-hmm. What do you think about that? Uh, they're exactly right. Um, Cause uh, uh, if you, if you, re- if you actually read Katie, Katie did, Katie did not believe that, uh, that the common man, uh, even the common white man should have to vote. Mm-hmm. Should be, uh, even she said it should be reserved. Landowners and, and, and the upper upper class educated people should have the right to vote because mm-hmm. the right to vote means the right to rule. Exactly. But there's not much she could do about white men having the right to vote. And she damn sure didn't want um, uh, uh, former slaves who were well beneath them, um, well beneath uh, 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 well beneath white people and considered savages to have the right to vote because mm-hmm. having the right to vote means that you have been elevated to what the status of men. Mm-hmm. And and white feminists have always fought against black men being elevated to the status of men, which is something Tommy has said consistently through the, throughout the man not. Yeah, yeah. They do not even black women, even black women do not want black men to have the status of what men, because that's a, that is the right to rule in this country in this in this society. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So and, so basically so all this so she's actually setting out the the uh, the pecking order, if you will, of the society. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and putting and putting black men at the bottom because black men are considered the, the the most savage. Shout out to Barry Little. Appreciate that support. Absolutely. Okay. Let me uh, go ahead and share another piece. I'm just I'm just putting out little nuggets. I mean, you got to this. This is um, because it's not again, it's not published. So once it's typeset, I don't know what the length of it'll be of it'll Mm -hmm. be. But single spaced in word, it's about 21 pages solid. Mm -hmm. And and, and man, it's it's a joy to read, you know, but 
that, you know, that depends on. <laughs> what yeah, you, you, know, you can tell was, there was some emotion in this. You could tell there's some emotion in this, even though it's uh, it's still academic and it's still cited. You can tell this is uh, there's some emotion in this because yeah. he's not really holding back. But I think the the key that that I don't want people to miss when it comes mm-hmm. to Dr. Curry's writing is that he's giving you the what I what I refer to as the fingerprints on history. In other yes. words, we have ideas and many of us don't know where these ideas come from. We just have them. We see the right. world a certain way. We communicate a certain way. We're treated even in regard to policy a certain way. But we often don't know where these ideas came from. Curry's work is as as freighted as it is, is as complex as it is. And again, as you said, he, he doesn't he doesn't play around with language. He gets to the point, but he, he there's an economy of space where he puts a lot into each sentence. But the point that I'm getting at here is he cites where they come from. You get yes. the names of the people. You get the quotes that led to it. And these pre these predate the actual policies that come later, which mm-hmm. you know predate the attitudes and perspectives that would become standardized. He, mm-hmm. He's giving you the names and he's kind of framing from their own words, you know, how they approach this and where a lot of these ideas that become popular come from. Um, so um, let me see. Uh, just take here. Let me pull this one. So I'm going to read two quotes here. The first one, uh, feminism, uh, and he's talking about Louise uh, Newman. Um, and, uh, mm-hmm. you know, he's talking about how she's been unwavering in her position that feminism, assimilation, and imperialism were historical siblings, the offspring mm-hmm. of a marriage between democratic ideal, ideals and social evolutionary beliefs. Equal citizenship was possible only for those who conformed to the racialized and gendered precepts of white civilization. These biases mm-hmm. were reflected in the leadership, member, and the overarching goals of the feminism of the late 19th century and throughout the 20th century that are rarely situated as deliberate dedications of feminism as an idea, right? Uh, mm-hmm. oh, let me see. And all right. So in the bottom one, current research into suffragism makes racism seem necessary and mm-hmm. natural among white suffragettes. A defensive and reactionary uh, response to the expansion of rights, of rights, mm-hmm. yeah, rather mm-hmm. than a political or ideological program of conscious choosing. Ironically, while suffragette writings and speeches often specifically name and target black men as the predominant threats to white to women, excuse me, to women's rights and white mm-hmm. civilization, few, if any, writings on the racism of the suffragette of the suffrage movement addresses the vitriol of the women's rights movement toward black males generally. Mm-hmm. And this is interesting because I think it has a lot to do with framing con- white women today mm-hmm. you know, in a certain kind of way. So what we hear is that they were racist and that was the that was just the racism of the time and they've evolved and everything is great now. But what, what gets missed in that is the very specific targeting of black men by these at this that's this time period by the very groups we learn about in school, they kind of dance around how specific their vitriol Mm -hmm. was for Mm -hmm. black males, not just for black people in a generic sense, for black males. And they saw this as a competition between themselves and black males for position in society. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, black males are a direct threat to what they believed is uh, an all white society. Mm -hmm. Direct threat. You know, uh, uh, physically, sexually, and if if you, so what happens when you give these Negroes rights and guns? Yeah. And oh. land and money. Oh yeah, right. Yeah, and their and their fear was, you know, what would be the kind of implosion of uh, civilization, right? Civilization by, by, by letting sa- yeah, yeah by letting sa- by letting savages uh, hold a position. In society mm-hmm. that they don't deserve, because after after all, they are not the counterpart to exactly, those who exactly. are imposing order on a savage world. It, exactly, exactly. That's what they believed, and it, you know, and to some extent, they they believe it. Uh, they believe it themselves. And the thing is, is that if you elevate black men, uh, the savages, to the level of men, then guess who becomes their master? Also, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. black men. Mm. And, and they were not having it. Yeah. No, not at all. And and so the, I think what he's pointing at at this stage of the paper is, is the deliberate nature of feminism, not this arbitrary idea that it just pops up out of a, a 
need for justice and a need for access to the vote. Now, that isn't to say women shouldn't vote. It's simply Mm -hmm. to say the agenda that white suffragists had went beyond voting simply to be represented in society and went directly at the the nature of civilization as they understood it and what Mm -hmm. role they should play. And what role they should play, exactly. As progenitors, I mean, they argued uh, that they, that they were actually the 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 means by which uh, you know racism or, or or white society white supremacy are is reproduced. They are the actual means by mm-hmm. so their argument was that not only do they have a place, mm-hmm. they have a place at, at white men's side. It's ice inside, and also you got to remember that uh, as a female, right? What is a female's uh, basic function? Is first functor, right? To give their their progeny. Uh, their offspring the best chance for survival and success right Mm -hmm. so if black men get the right to vote and get the same rights as white men guess who their their white sons competitors are Mm -hmm. yeah yeah and if you give them access and that competition increases it it, and and their perception of it it means that whites fall back yes society begins to crumble right yes yeah um so, oh, and one of the things he kind of also points out here in, in regard to feminism is that it basically took advantage of the science of its time. Whatever the science was of its time in the 19th century, we we're talking about evolutionary ethnology. Uh, in the 20th century, you're talking about criminology. But he said basically feminism just kind of poured itself into whatever bottle it could that yeah. advanced its, its positioning in society. Mm-hmm. It did. It did what you know, they whatever bottle it could, and basically, in, in what the, as as feminism evolved, they put themselves at the forefront of every movement uh-huh. that they could. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And they're still doing that. And we and, and so I think the danger of this piece of, of the, this particular paper, um, and much of Curry's work on you know suffragettes and feminism in general is mm-hmm. that it really casts contemporary white women, contemporary feminism, contemporary mm-hmm. black feminism mm-hmm. in a different light. And it forces us to ask questions that we weren't allowed to ask because we were presented this history uh, from a very politicized source. We were presented it as a, as a kind of a natural, um, you know, uh, evolutionary, you know, develop, evolutionarily developed kind of idea that was really in the, the best interests of society. You know, it's presented to us as this is just a necessary good that it, you know, that advanced our thinking. But in actuality, it was very much a political endeavor. Mm-hmm. And it was very much about advancing a particular group of women, even at the expense of other groups of women, but definitely at the expense of the black community. Mm-hmm. Right? Exactly. So, um, you know, and he even shows kind of how, you know, they've used key ideas like abortion, for example, uh, where in one vein in the 19th century, they would they would attribute abortion to savages mm-hmm. and then half a century later argue for the right to do it. They're they're You know, they, they kind of, you know, flipped with the wind as far as whatever empowered them in the moment. So um, but he says at a particular point. Right. And this is where he breaks the paper up. And I'll share that so you guys can at least see the structure that he's using that those of you who are interested might be able to follow on. But he says, uh, in using the term racial backlash in the title uh, to describe feminism, I mean to convey a deliberate and dedicated program of action by a dominant group, in this case, white women, who along with various white supremacists and entities sought to eradicate the perceived gains of suffrage and citizenship for blacks through the criminalization of black men. Like well-established conceptualizations of racial backlash as forceful swings against a a perceived unwelcome change to the status quo, indicated by a strong adverse reaction against various racial remedies adopted by national governments for the effects of centuries-long racial discrimination. This chapter conceptualizes the deployment of ethnology and criminology by white feminist leaders and thinkers as a response to the perceived gains Black Americans achieved from the mid-1800s to the 1980s, right? So he's talking about the specific response to the advancement of black folk from the the end of the Civil War uh, to the 1980s, right? Mm-hmm. And so he breaks the paper up here into four uh, four uh, distinct sections, right? The first part 
uh, having to do with the history of suffrage and the theory of gender uh, complementarianism underlying much of Elizabeth Cady Stanton's analysis of male power during the 1860s. Mm -hmm. Part two deals with the theme of racial evolution as it's read through the work of Charlotte Perkins, Perkins Gilman, mm -hmm. uh, who is often, often, as he says, unappreciated as an ethno ethnological theorist. Her theory of racial development situates the maternal Mm -hmm. as the foundation of white patriarchy and mm -hmm. white imperial power. Right. Yep. So, so the narrative we're given is that feminists had to kick their way in the room because sexism was keeping them out and they had to force the, themselves in to be represented. What Curry is saying here is if you look at the works of uh, suffragist uh, racial theorists, they were arguing that the very idea of white imperial power and patriarchy is situated in the white maternal, right? The feminine, you know, so it's not an added in later component to white supremacy. It's actually one of the four foremost center points yes. for the white supremacist idea, right? The maternal, right? It's not It's not a, a separate component that add, that's added in later. It's a, 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 a base point that that's used to build off of. Mm -hmm. Section three concerns itself with the women's. Appreciate that support, Kassan. Thank you. Um, hold on, I'm gonna. I'm gonna, gonna kind of highlight some of these uh, super chats. Thank you for talking about uh, this, especially Bell Hooks. No one is bringing to light the impact of feminism on black men. Keep up the great work. Of course, we got to do this. Got to do this. Um, so, section three concerns itself with. Uh, women's rights activists in the 1920s through the 1960s, uh, following the following the declines of America's imperial ventures, white women's rights activists used the language of white women's vulnerability and their newly won enfranchisement to support mm -hmm. racial segregationist policies and establish KKK organizations throughout the South. And he talked; he's been talking about this for a couple of years mm -hmm. about white women starting their own faction of the KKK. Yep. Where you know, as and identifying themselves distinctly as women, not joining the KKK and operating in the background, you know, cooking dinner and you know, or no, they actually had a faction uh where they identified themselves as women of the clan, right? So he talks about this and and the use of their vulnerability, right? When white women's vulnerability in white society is a huge motivating factor in terms of how uh, their policies are played out. I mean, at, for the, at the end of the day, if you look at pretty much every lynching you ran across of black mm -hmm. men, white women were implicated, right? The idea that their vulnerability was at stake, that black men were threatening their vulnerability, threatening their very well-being, whether it be through violence or whether it be through sex and potential reproduction, either way, right? Women's White women's vulnerability was the kind of rallying call or white supremacist behavior. And then of mm -hmm. course the last section, and this is the part I think you and I were, were, were talked about most, um, focus on legislation and theories, white feminists endorsed at the expense of black Americans who believed their protest and spilled blood would bring about equality in the 1960s and 70s. Ultimately, this chapter aims to provide insight into white feminist theories about race and black men that drove their reactionary politics and insidious claims about black male deviants from the 1860s to the 1980s. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts about that? Um, basically, basically, what he's doing is he's giving you the uh, the 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 what I call the fishbone, right? The the mm -hmm. antecedents from from beginning to end to connect all these dots uh, to let you know that uh, what you the policies you see, uh, feminist policies you see in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and even today. Are, are are rooted in uh the, the race it's racist past it's segregation is past mm -hmm. and women are not this uh by the innocent bystander that they claim to be feminists are not this innocent bystander that they claim to be mm -hmm. they're actually uh an integral part of what we call white supremacy they are right even today the the, the fact that you don't you don't hear the uh white feminists arguing against uh the end of uh you know uh possible end of affirmative action as it goes to the supreme court mm. they're not arguing against it mm -hmm. because it uh because they they got what they needed out of it so they think it should go away in fact uh i think i actually 
uh, did a video uh, um, uh, I think Tim Wise's uh, uh, 1998 piece uh, that he published called "Is a Sisterhood uh, um, Is a Sisterhood Consensual." In other words, um, are white women sharing uh, affirmative action with their so-called black sisters? And the, and, the, and the biggest opponents of affirmative action were not white men. They're actually white women. Mm. Yeah. All, I think it was like uh, uh, eight out of, the t out of the 10 suits that actually made it to the Supreme Court against uh, affirmative action. Eight of them were actually filed by women, mm. by white women. Mm. You know, even it, though even though white feminism has this kind of gentler face on the surface that's taught in uh in academia. Man, look, I'm gonna tell you guys, you guys have no idea. Whenever I cover one of these papers, um the hardest part for me is what to talk about. Like it it there's so many different components to this mm -hmm. that it's it's difficult to choose, you know, because any one of them is, is gonna give you plenty of uh fodder for dialogue but i mean it's yeah. just it's just yeah. so much i mean the, the middle section I, I'm you, I think it was uh section three uh with the with, with the racist feminist uh she believed that lynching in in, in the, the, the the lynching was a proper uh use to keep black men especially black men under control mm -hmm. in yeah. other words the, the fear the the the, the keep of the fear of uh black men being not raping but accused of rape that they would get punished and lynched was a way it was a control mechanism it was a control mechanism yeah 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 and it, and it was actually a control mechanism for women as well right the idea that um you know them being violated is something mm -hmm. that they needed to guard against especially yes. like black men as yes. well as uh teaching black men it, that the very accusation could take your life and because because what do we what do black men still get a, accused of even today yeah, violence and rape by their own women absolutely. absolutely which is one of the points i made in one of my, one of my shows the other day where we're looking at a case from a major university mm -hmm. where you had one white male doctor who sexually violated over 400 black men over a thousand uh, athletes in general and mm -hmm. yet the prevailing conversation in american society about sexual threat, violence, so on and so forth, mm -hmm. are celebrity black men. That's it. No six-part documentaries on anybody else. The primary focus is on black men. Mm -hmm. Despite this historical legacy, despite the prevalence of how much it's gone on, uh, none of that seems to matter. None of that seems to matter. But there's an interesting section here where he talks about the dynamics of... Um, Black men and I'm um, excuse me, uh, black men and white women, and I want to get your feedback from this. Um, mm -hmm. Here, let me put this up. And I'm pretty much, I mean, it, I'm going to stick to uh, section four because there's so much to go over. Uh, but I just want to stick to section four. There's one paragraph, and you covered this in your video that was so mm -hmm. critical to this discussion. We mm -hmm. haven't gotten to it yet, but this paragraph here I thought was interesting. I want to get your feedback on this as well. The sexual threat black men were said to pose to white women um, understood as a need for white racial unity to protect white civilization against the pestilence of the black freed men. Right? Mm -hmm. Popular periodicals such as Good Housekeeping sometimes included editorials of professional white women commenting on the ever-present threat of the Negro man. One such article entitled The White Woman and the Negro Man by Ellen B. Lagon insisted that the burden of black uh, enfranchisement shouldered by the white woman or was shouldered by the white woman, the threat of developing an alien black race, but one century removed from barbarism mm -hmm. was that it could jeopardize the white race's sacred responsibility, the preservation of an untainted white civilization developed to its utmost possibility. The mm -hmm. Negro was misled in believing they could be equals of whites. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Writes Lagan, the greatest wrong ever done civilization was when thousands of beings, but two degrees removed from naked barbarism, were declared by law and taught that they were the social equals of a race which represented mm. the refinement, the chivalry, the bravery of thousands of years of civilization. Black male enfranchisement and the quest for black social equality was framed as a threat to white women's future liberties. 
the freed black man, incapable of controlling his insatiable lust for white women, uses rape as a weapon to exact vengeance against the white race. Lagan urged the white world to hear her pleas as let all the world listen while the South calls on you to hear the white woman is the coveted desire of the Negro man. The despoiling of the white woman is his chosen vengeance. The white woman must be saved. My, my God. <laughs> my God. Now, there's so much of this language that is mm -hmm. still practiced, even if mm -hmm. it's not stated aloud. Mm -hmm. But we also saw a period where this language was kind of appropriated within the confines of the Black community where the idea was that it was taken and appropriated where instead of the Negro who has to defile white women, right? Now the Negro has to defile women yes. to mimic white patriarchy. And this was the yeah. accusation first levied by white women, according to Dr. Curry, and mm -hmm. then appropriated by black feminists and, and again, used as a, an attack salvo against black men. So the idea mirrored itself from white feminists to black feminists that all black men could do was mimic white men mm -hmm. and their desire to oppress first white women, but also black women to identify mm -hmm. and frame themselves. So when you hear on Twitter, right, these ideas that all black men want to do is mimic white men, that right. they don't have any other, their, any sense of their own manhood, that, mm -hmm. you know, all of these kind of base, yes. misandrous kind of statements, they actually come out of 19th and 20th century <laughs> white feminist literature. Yes, it does. In fact, uh, they were saying that, uh, they're comparing the the black man is uh, is the son or offspring to uh, white manhood, and yes. what is a what is a, what does the son do? He mimics his father. He mimics his father, right? mm -hmm. because and if you look at uh, you know Dr. Curry's book, The Man Not, one of the things he talks about is the almost mythical framework, the allegorical mm -hmm. framework of the plantation, where mm -hmm. white my, white men and women were considered the father and mother of the American family. Exactly. Yes. And black men and women were the children. With children, the offspring, yes. The offspring. Mm -hmm. And that needed to be uh, enslaved really for their own good mm -hmm. in order for them to be properly inducted into civilization on mm -hmm. proper terms. They had to be inducted in uh, through uh, abuse, through exploitation, through enslavement. Mm -hmm. And this, this you know, kind of situated their position in the hierarchy, but that was the role they were supposed to play. Mm -hmm. in society, in civilization. Mm -hmm. right? And so by establishing this narrative with feminism, right, from the 19th to the 20th century, it, it, what he ends up kind of setting up for us is the link between white feminism and black feminism in a very particular way. And I talked about this when I interviewed him on the show. Um, I think this was 2020, where we were he was talking about it at that time, and he still is in this paper the way in which uh, the subculture of violence theory works. The subculture of violence theory is basically a, a theory put forth by white scholars that had no uh, empirical backing whatsoever. Exactly, yes. That made the argument that black folk, but black men in particular, were tied to violence. They were tied to violence, they were tied to poverty, and it was a part of their being. And, and although none of this had any kind of, you know, empirical, you know, documentation, it was nevertheless what they were at their core. And thus, in order to deal with them, you had to understand that about them. Right. And what he begins to say from here is literally, and he shows in 2020, he was talking about this. He was citing the black feminists who were appropriating this language in their early works. Mm -hmm. Wholesale. Wholesale. Yes and not even discussing the subculture of violence as a theory that had no backing. They were talking about it as a truth. It's a fact, yes. As mm -hmm. a fact, and as black women living in the black community, they were able to give it legs in the sense that they authorized it. These feminists were authorizing racist scholarship by simply saying, well, this, you know, this is true. In, in, in essence, it was received as this is true because mm -hmm. we live with them. Yes, yeah. So they kind of yeah. authorize this. Well, go ahead. And, and basically, it's, it, they still do because you know you've argued that uh, that uh, that even uh, uh, domestic violence is is uh, is bidirectional. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and they still quote uh, untrue things like the uh, like uh, 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 how many black women are actually killed by black males. Uh, 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 basically, what is it? Uh, 
one in four, not even one in four, actually more than that. Uh, most black women will be violated or raped within her lifetime, right? Mm. Mm. But uh, 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 basically, uh, um, one in what is it? What one in one in four black women will actually be uh, uh, beaten or, or hurt or injured by her by her spouse, mm -hmm. especially black men. And, and basically, you you, you uh, Dr. Curry, uh, uh, Green Gorilla has actually actually shown the stats. This is not true. Yeah. But they still hold on to them. This is where it comes from. Let me see if I if I have it uh, here to pull up. Um, hold on. Okay, my little trying to get it to wake up here. Uh, here we go. No, that's the wrong chart. <laughs> my okay. bad. I mean, even to this day, the black women are, are, are still calling the black family, the black society, a failed patriarchy. In other words, you black men trying to mimic what white men do. Exactly. And not only was it, was it never a patriarchy, black men did not aspire as white men did. Right. To engage in that manner. OK, so here we go. Let me I'll put this. Let's see, I'll put this over here and see if I can get it on screen for you guys because it speaks to the point that BGS was just making about the data and the way in which that data is being used in a manner that primarily benefits, um, you know, women in a very distinct way and ignores the reality of what black men engage. So this is something you can find on my blog, right? The blog is... Uh, Oh, there you go. Oh, there it is. <laughs> uh, did they change it? I hope not. I hope not, because sometimes they change the damn uh, URL without my kind of approval there. But hold on. Appreciate that support, Cameron. Um, Cameron says, uh, appreciate the good work, uh, brother. Continue spreading the knowledge. Will do. Uh, so newblackmasculinities.wordpress.com. You can go there and you can check this out. And if you actually click on the most popular articles, there's a piece in there called Male Information, Male Rape Information Sheet, Contrasting Dominant Stereotypes. And this was something I did some years ago just to kind of uh, bring together some relevant information that impacts uh, the ideas that, that, you know, in regard to sexual violence and, and shows us where this is, this is situated in regard to gender. So what you were citing, I think, was the fourth bullet point. Mm -hmm. uh, where it says one out of every four black men and black women have experienced rape, physical violence, and stalking by an intimate partner in a lifetime. Mm -hmm. It's decided in 2010, right? But we don't hear about black men. We just hear about women, whether be they white or black. Right? Mm -hmm. Very little information about black men who've experienced this. And this is a result in many ways of the, the historical legacy of feminism that uh, Dr. Curry is talking about where these issues are framed strictly in terms of how women experience them. So the experiences of men are not a factor, right? So this is uh, this piece here. No. Okay. Oh, I guess that one's a little clearer. All right. So if you can't see that, you know, like I said, go to newblackmasculinities.wordpress.com, click on uh, most popular and scroll down to you see male rape information sheet. And there are a series of citations and sources at the bottom for the information. And one of the most critical was a Time Magazine post where they acknowledge uh, the CDC data, right? That basically argue that women rape men as often as men rape women, right? But again, not something we tend to see as the data has been present being presented. It's primarily focused one way. Yes. Yeah. And, and and basically, this is the tradition that it comes out of. And that's what uh, Dr. Curry's pointed to. Uh, in other words, uh, this didn't come, didn't come out of empirical data or empirical uh, uh, or, or on the ground happenings. This is something that did, didn't come out of a vacuum. This actually was stated 100, 150 years ago. Mm -hmm. and, and that tradition has been carried forward in, into modern day feminism as we speak. In fact, it, it's so it's so pervasive. It's actually into pe even people that don't consider themselves feminists. I actually heard a womanist uh, argue. I think I can't remember what panel they were actually on, right? And um, 
they're going back and forth about um, um, uh, but black men and women actually getting together and coming together and actually solving some of these problems. Uh -huh. And right out of her mouth, she said, well, first, you got, we have to uh, get you Negroes to stop beating on us. Yes, right, right. When the data shows that the rates of bidirectional violence are equal. Or equal. And, and at certain periods of time, even as, as early as or as far back as the 1980s, they actually, mm -hmm. you know, black women actually were more violent. The rates were higher in terms of black men being victims of intimate partner violence so that, mm -hmm. you know, so you can see this back and forth and yet the way it's presented, it's a one way dynamic. And I think mm -hmm. much of feminism, per, per, you know, kind of portrays violence and sexual violence as a one way dynamic. Rarely do I hear feminists talking about, um, you know, uh, sexual aggression against men and boys by women and girls. Very rarely do I hear that mentioned. And I'm being polite when I say rarely, I actually can't think of a time where I have, but I'm saying rarely, to be fair, right? Mm -hmm. But for the most part, I don't hear it. So that kind of one-dimensional presentation of violence has further helped shape how we perceive uh, men and women and how mm -hmm. we conceptualize the nature of gender in relation to violence. And I think the prevailing idea is that men are bigger, stronger, they have more testosterone, and thus they are the only ones that abuse and women are consistently victims. Of men, mm -hmm. and that's it. And, and who are who are the biggest, strongest, and have the most testosterone? Black men. Exactly. We're the we're the hyper masculine threat, mm -hmm. right? And speaking of which, there 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 comes a very political side to this dynamic. Appreciate that support, Cameron. Um, there's another side to this dynamic in terms of how that violence is used, because what Curry what Curry is arguing here is that the violence that's being used, first of all, it's being propped up, it's being it's being exaggerated, right? Mm -hmm. It's definitely not being uh, analyzed empirically and it's definitely not being compared to other groups, other demographics who are initiating violence. Black men mm -hmm. are being pulled out as an aside and focused on, you know, primarily, you know, as this is framed. They're separated from every other demographic and looked at and accused in line with this racist stereotypical narrative about black men to be the most hypermasculine, the most dangerous, the most abusive, the most, you know, rape, rape oriented, you know, the most violent. But he actually argues that there's a very political role mm -hmm. that, that violence yes, plays in the advancement of white women. Yeah. yeah. In fact, it's used as a control mechanism. Yes, very much so. And so there's a section I want to share. And of course, we got to get uh, Brother BGS's reflections on this. So I'll start at the top, especially for our innerlightradio.com uh, folks listening. We got 305 people listening. Support the show. Support the show, please. Make sure you do so. And also support uh, innerlightradio.com, black owned, right? So you can hear us on there. We got people listening all over the world through innerlightradio.com. Also YouTube, also Facebook, also LinkedIn, also Twitch, support the show. Anyway, the use of violence against black men became a defining feature white, white womanhood, uh, uh, became a defining feature white womanhood at the turn of the 20th century and energized several new political organizations to meet the now evolved status of mm. white womanhood. Say that, say that, say that. The, in other words, the evolved status of white womanhood outside of the home. Mm. Go ahead. Go ahead and respond to that. And in, in other words, basically, uh, uh, start off as being part of the patriarchy, mm -hmm. and then now as the as 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 the as the country evolves, as the civilization evolves, they're evolving to their role instead of being the hearth in the home and 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 the uh, mothers and the protector of the home. Now they're evolving to outside the home. Mm -hmm. So now you see the evolution of not only feminism but also white supremacy. Yeah. to where white women become uh, co-creators of, of, of white supremacy. But go ahead. Now, we got to, just real quick, we did get a message in from South Africa, and it reads, mm -hmm. Hello, gentlemen, today I'm listening to you from uh, Bachabelo in the Western Cape of South Africa, and I must say that as disturbing as I, I am finding your analysis, I'm seeing a black feminist trend growing that is being energized by academic whites and the confusion yes. it causes has yes. become a hindrance to our post-apartheid empowerment uh, quest. Yes. At this point, my observations are undeniable. Shout out to Toma. See, so this is this, what we're seeing here, and the reason this is so important is because what Curry is talking about has become a global phenomenon. Mm -hmm. In many ways, the, the very type of feminism we're talking about has been internalized 
and and, and it's been in, in, invoked across the world. Mm-hmm. So it's important that we begin to have dialogues across the, the the you know boundaries, national boundaries, because we're seeing the blowback happening the same way. But anyway, so he talks about the use of violence against black men become, becoming a defining feature of white womanhood, and then he continues. The early 20th century not only saw a federal amendment granting white women the right to vote as an extension, as an expansion of the voting rights they enjoyed in roughly half of the states prior to the passage of the 19th Amendment, um, but the disenfranchisement of black voters throughout states uh, through literacy tests and lynch mob violence. The disen- oh, appreciate that, Mr. Blue Collar. Good to see you up in here. Appreciate the support. Um, he says... Uh, to, uh, wait, let me see where I left off. Okay. Uh, the, dis- the disenfranchisement of Blacks, particularly Black men, was a platform for newly enfranchised white women who saw Jim Crow segregation as a vital policy, right, that ensured their safety and the triumph of white civilization to protect the spatial order of the South that confined Black male to the bottom of civil society. White women began to turn away from imperial feminism Toward, or toward domestic ethno-nationalism. Ironically, this was also the same time that saw white women attempt to relinquish their historical argument that they were intended by God and nature to be rulers of the darker races alongside white men and move toward a political and academic narrative asserting that they were now oppressed by white men in ways that mirrored the racist oppression of several racial minority groups like blacks and Jews. Any thoughts about that, brother? Uh, yeah, they're reframing themselves. In other words, you know, uh, the to the victor uh, goes the rewrite of history. Mm-hmm. So they're refra- reframing themselves instead of being part of white supremacist, uh, reframing themselves as an innocent bystander, as uh, as a person that's being oppressed. Mm-hmm. Never happened, but the thing is, historically, they're reframing themselves because now they want the same kind of power that uh, white men have. And so this is one of the ways we talk about how white feminism stole civil rights. Mm-hmm. The, the preeminent way we can point to were the way, was the way in which white women appropriated the struggle by repositioning themselves as victims mm-hmm. and, and as, as oppressed and thus uh, needing to be rescued by policy. Mm-hmm. Right? So they went from arguing just a few years, just a few decades prior, that they were the proper enco- accompaniment to white mm-hmm. men to mm-hmm. rule, you know, a darker races, as they say. And then by the time you get to the 1960s and 70s, now they're arguing mm-hmm. that they are the most oppressed group. Right? That's what we begin to see. It, 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 politically and, uh, and financially oppressed, not physically oppressed. Mm. The gilded cage. Although, although they would use abuse, use the very idea of abuse, you know, because it's mm-hmm. white feminists that really really pushed uh, for policy on abuse. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I mean, you have people that were all kinds of abused, but what people overlook is that when you look at those early movements, you know, to kind of save women from men's abuses, especially when Mm -hmm. they set up, um, when they set up those uh, shelters, Mm -hmm. some of the earliest, uh, you know, people who were running those shelters. when Ellen Ellen Prizzy. Yeah. Yeah, Ellen Prizzy. When, When she talked about bringing in women for the first time and she was interviewing them, those women pointed out that they were just as violent as their men. And as a matter of fact, they grew up in violence, as did the men. They mm-hmm. were used to it. And in many instances, they they initiated it. Mm-hmm. You know, there were women in those shelters that talked about, you know, they hit their husbands with baseball bats and then grabbed their kids and came to the shelter. Like, mm-hmm. And it wasn't out of self-defense. It was just part of the climate of the social environment that they had all grown up in. And she mm-hmm. was, she as a feminist, she was shocked. Because this did this kind of went against the narrative of women being abused and needing to be protected when they were just as much a part of the violence. She didn't anticipate that. Aaron, Aaron Prison. Oh, um, incredibly important. Let me see. I'm just going through here, and I'm I'm really trying to choose the choice segments that uh, I want to chew on because there are so many. Uh, ha, ha, ha. I think. Uh, I think my brother might enjoy this piece here. Quite a bit of meat on the bone here. So, mm. uh, you know, uh, did you want to? Did you want to jump into this one? No, mm. no. Go ahead and read it. Yeah, go ahead and read it. 
The desegregation of public institutions following Brown versus Board of Education did not arrest the proliferation of negative stereotypes or the endorsement of erroneous pseudoscientific explanations of black male savagery by white feminist scholars or activists. Feminist organizations often acted to impede singular concessions for black civil rights without specific provisions aimed at increasing the political opportunities for white women. The strategy of the National Women's Party, a wealthy, exclusively white feminist organization dedicated to the political and economic interests of white women, wanted to see sex added to mm. Title VII legislation, mm -hmm. despite the dangers it posed to the passing of the legislation. The National Women's Party decided to approach Congressman Howard C. Smith. Smith was an 81-year-old conservative Democrat from Virginia who had a history of being against Black civil rights initiatives and equal pay. According to Carolyn Byrd's Born Female, The High Cost of Keeping Women Down, Smith's efforts extended the promise. Now, this is probably, mm -hmm. this is, this you know, this is an opinion, but this is probably the most important sentence in this whole section. You know, it, it says Smith's efforts extended the promise of equal opportunity from the 7 million Negro men and women workers that Title VII was drafted to protect to 21 million white women who did not get as high compensation for their work as the Negro members of the majority sex. Majority sex, and yeah, that's very true. That's very true. If you look at the uh, at the pay scales, the the uh, the median rates, I think is the average pay of uh, white men, black uh, uh, black men, uh, white women, and black women. Actually, black women and white women are actually uh, lower on the totem pole and actually very close together. And Black men were actually within like 25, 20 to 25 percent of white men. And the goal was to actually equalize mm -hmm. uh, the male pay across the board. Right? right. White women didn't want that. But if you look at these charts over time, right, slowly but surely, black, well, white women actually left white, black women behind and actually uh, caught up and passed, surpassed over the period of 40 years, surpassed. Uh, or, or black men is 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 uh, in pay. In fact, black men have been lowered uh, closer to where w the position of white women were uh, in the 1960s, where they're just above black women in pay. If you look, if you look at the pay charts, uh, black women were within like 10 percent of, of of what black men make, mm -hmm. and uh, and now white women are, are, are in the same position. About uh, what he said, say 20 cents, uh, uh, 80 cents of a, on a dollar of of, mm -hmm. of what white men make. Mm -hmm. All they did was actually flop the positions between um, black men and white women. But this That's is what an, they did. But this is an incredibly uh, important period because mm -hmm. if you look at post World War II, when you had white soldiers at war, mm -hmm. you had factories that needed workers. Of course, uh, white women, black women, and black men actually got to work those jobs that were normally reserved for white men. Mm -hmm. But this is the period. This is the, the this is the production of what would become the civil rights generation. Whereas for the black community, you actually had stable income. You even right. had you even had uh, uh, union membership to some extent uh, mm -hmm. with black men who were working in these factories. And by the time white soldiers come back and many of those jobs go back to them, black men are still able to have a bit of a foothold from the right. 1940s to the 1970s in these kind of jobs. And this is the this is what produces the next generation. They're coming up in a far more economically stable situation than they mm -hmm. did during the sharecropping era prior to the Great Migration. So black folk are, you know, we just had a taste, just a short period, maybe three decades, in, uh, give or take a few years, that where you got to actually see the impact of a stable economy. Yeah. So yeah. when you start and to talk about Title VII and the potential it could have had, right. its gaze was shifted to white women. Yes, the community could have looked like that, that, if, if you know this one thing that I, I love uh, Yvette and Tone that they talk about the wealth gap. But mm -hmm. if you if you flop if if you flop the position of white of black men and white women as far as earning potentials, and you actually double uh, double the wealth of, of of the white family with uh, with white women, guess what happens to the wealth gap? It doubles. It expands because you've taken you've taken jobs and opportunities away from black men to yeah. actually bring it back to their families yeah. and give it to white women. So what do you expect? There's going to be a wealth gap. That's why the next this is why the next uh, paragraph is so important. Go ahead and read it. Well, it, well we're going to get we're going to get there. But I okay. Just add, in relation to what you just said. So we have, mm -hmm. you know, when we look at the data it says for every dollar a white man makes. I think white women are 75 cents. Black women are what? 63, 64 cents. 
Right. Black men make a few cents more unless you control for incarceration. If mm-hmm. you control for incarceration, black men make about 51 cents. So in essence, when you see two people married, when you see a family, you're talking about $1.75 for a white family. Right. And for a black family, you're talking about maybe a dollar ten, depending right. on the situation. But if you talk about two gay men, two gay white men, you're talking about two dollars. There's another report I did earlier this week where we looked at the ways in which sexuality affects income. Even black men, even black gay men earn more, according mm-hmm. to one study that talked about the ways in which, you know, man, black manhood, the way black masculinity is being talked about in this paper, the way black, I shouldn't say black masculinity, but the way black men are perceived in relation to this paper, it still affects hiring and pay practices to this day. Because mm-hmm. black men are seen as a threat, especially heterosexual black men. You actually mm-hmm. see them being paid less, being hired less. Uh, and it, so these things have ramifications on race, gender and sexuality. But let me finish with this last sentence that's incredibly important to this section. The effect of adding sex to the anti-discrimination laws was that it ensured white women captured the majority of the jobs and employment initiatives meant to address the racial dist- the racist distribution of economic wealth and labor participation. Boom. Can't That's put it. it any more can't put it any more bluntly than that. Yeah. That is the core of the idea, right? This was the shift. This was the moment where you saw feminism appropriating civil rights because what people often forget is that the legal arm, you know, a lot of civil rights was addressing the legal. Thurgood mm-hmm. Marshall, you know, they were when they were pushing for policy in court. Mm-hmm. So you had opportunity here Right. With the potential passing of these policies. But the Gucci booted foot, as Bill Burr <laughs> terms it, plays a significant role in white women being able to shift from demanding to be co-patriarchs to being, um, you know, a female victim mm-hmm. and appropriating the resources that end up becoming, um, you know, a yet another addition to white wealth. Mm hmm. Now, now, this was the section you introduced in your piece. Um, can you now? I don't know if you can see my screen well enough, but okay. uh, you pulled this out, and I really wanted to, to you know, I wanted to hear you kind of address it, if you would. Uh, did you want to read it, or do you want me? Go ahead, read it. Okay. Uh, the economic vulnerabilities of black men and women were well understood by policymakers and feminist organizations at the time. In fact, many liberals and women's organizations in 1964 opposed adding sex to the civil rights bill primarily because they did not want to endanger protection for Negroes, but also because absolute equality between sexes before the law might endanger rights and immunities favoring women. Smith intended to sink to sink Title VII because it was intended to protect Black civil rights and ensure Black labor participation well past the 20th century. While the bill did manage to pass, the addition of sex so radically altered the scope of the legislation that it became impossible to maintain that remedying black racial injustice was or ever could be the priority of the legislation ever again. Mm, Yes. The addition of of the sex category was meant to prioritize the rights of white women over those those are blacks. Yes. Yes. Congresswoman Martha Griffith argued on the floor of Congress that without sex being added to Title VII legislation, white women would be at be last at the hiring gate. Mm-hmm. This argument was pervasive, or excuse me, this argument was persuasive to white legislatures later, later who saw the benefit and racial advantage of safeguarding white women over black workers, be they men or women. And so in other words, it, it's it's the same thing as protecting white women against rape. Mm. Instead of them being physically raped or graped it, it, uh, uh, on the outside, they, they, it protects them in the workforce. So uh-huh. basically, you, you, instead of protecting them against white men, you protect them against uh, the, the comp- black competitors for the same jobs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's I mean, you can't put any more plainly to this because, you know, 60 years later is borne out. You know, who are the, who are the, the, the biggest uh, benefactors of civil rights? of affirmative action it's not black people mm-hmm. you know um in fact the uh the, the you know, in fact the uh, monahan that's going to go back to monahan report right he mm-hmm. meant for those jobs to actually go to black men so they could lead their family you know mm-hmm. monahan wanted to build a black patriarchy in the black community 
Mm. And guess who were against the building of a black patriarch in a black community? White feminists, white feminists and black women. And they knew, like I said, the liberals knew that putting sex in would actually sink, sink the spirit of the bill. Mm -hmm. In other words, it would actually kill the remedies that you're passing the legislation for. Mm. And effectively, that's what it did. That's how come the black community is still maybe a little bit above where it was uh, before, uh, prior to civil rights, but not much more at least economically okay mm -hmm. you, you don't have to step off the sidewalk or cast your eyes down but economically you're almost in the same place right and this is where when you talk about um racism and this is another paper uh, uh dr curry does racism as misandric aggression right mm -hmm. the expression of racism as we understand it being targeted mm -hmm. to black men in particular to black males in general mm -hmm. Right. More so than any other demographic, when you look at it empirically, and this, of course, reaffirms Sedanius's work. But the idea that racism in and of itself is targeted on black males, you actually see that playing out right here in terms of the potential for ongoing labor and the mm -hmm. capacity to support the black family. Because what does it actually do? I mean, when black men actually get paid, you know, they tend to think that especially if they're in a period where we're marrying more than any other demographic. What does that do for black families? Mm hmm. Right? But when you reach an era where marriage is on the low and black men are, for the most part, expelled from black families due to uh, responses to policy. And this is something I've been talking about for a while. I don't argue uh, that black women just woke up one day and hated black men. No, this is part of what Dr. Curry is talking about here is a conditioning process that's supported by policy and the perceptions of black men as lesser beings, mm -hmm. as less capable is rooted in these policy Mm -hmm. uh, practices that excluded them from being able to compete in society. I don't care how many, you know, entrepreneurship businesses you try to start. If you are excluded mm -hmm. from participation by policy, you are hampered. It's like trying to run a foot race when somebody's chopped off your foot. It doesn't. Mm -hmm. You're going to be behind. And when you follow that with a couple of generations of continued policy, what you end up having is black men, even within communities, being perceived as the problem. Mm -hmm. being perceived as not worthy of being a part of the family. They're worthy of providing sperm, maybe occasional sexual gratification, but they cannot be depended upon mm -hmm. because of a, the, this kind of idea that they are inherently failures. Black men are not inherently failures. We've been purposely and structurally mm -hmm. underdeveloped. Mm -hmm. What Curry is talking about here, again, by situating feminism not as a side project, but as central mm -hmm. To the state, what you end up talking about is the need to underdevelop black men as a part of its part it's of structural. Program. It's structural, yeah. It's structural. It's not yeah. an accident. It's not an. It's not a product of not trying hard enough. It's not a product of not being smart enough, not being driven enough. It doesn't have to do with any of that shit. And those are the stereotypes that have been that have been levied against black men from the from the larger society and even intra racially in the community. Black men are less than because they mm -hmm. don't compete as well. But nobody wants to talk about why. Right. It's the legacy that structurally produced the ongoing policy and the internalization of the, those ideas rooted in that policy, even within black communities themselves. Right. And he actually talks about this uh, right here. Let me uh, bring yeah, this. Because I, I was actually, uh, we we're actually reading the Kerner Commission. Uh, me and uh, Art of Itmore yesterday, right? About the the uh, where where a lot of the uh, affirmative action policies actually came from, right? We're actually uh, reading that uh, back then. I think the uh, unemployment rate was uh, for black men was like seven percent, seven or eight percent. I think it was seven point one percent, right? Mm -hmm. That's exactly what it is today. Mm -hmm. Where has it, where has it improved over the last you know? Uh, over the last 50, 55 years hasn't improved. Yeah. yeah. Um, you're in the same spot. E economically, you're in the same spot. Let me, uh, let me shout out Kevin. Uh, let me shout out the jig is up. Let me shout out Lackenzie and Elwood. Appreciate the cash app uh, donations. Uh, thank you for supporting the show. He talks about this here. 
Mm -hmm. The inability of black men to achieve economic or political independence or patriarchy prompted white feminists to insist that black males were childlike mm. or imitative of white men who were and are their masters. Suleiman Firestone argued in The Dialectics of Sex that the relationship between the black man and the white man duplicates the relationship of the male child to the father. Mm. We have seen how a certain point in order... Uh, <laughs> Uh, MS Delta, appreciate that support. Um, okay, let me see. Uh, the, uh, okay, so we've seen how a certain point in order to assert his ego, the child must transfer his identification from the female powerless to the male powerful. In the attempt to imitate white men, black men distorted white culture and embraced pathology as a substitute for power. With the publication of Susan Brown Miller's Against Our Will, Men, Women, and Rape, 1975, feminist theory had successfully linked subculture theory, subcultural theories of violence with the analytical concept of gender. Don B, appreciate that support. Right? Brown Miller had great admiration for the explanatory power of subculture, subcultural theories of sexual violence. According to Brown Miller, the single most important contribution of Amir's Philadelphia study was to place the rapist squarely within the mm. subculture of violence. The mm. rapist, it was revealed, had no separate identifiable pathology aside from the individual quirks um, and uh, personality disturbances that might characterize any single offender who commits any sort of crime. This was especially true of poor young black males who were culturally um, predisposed to such violence. Um, by the 1980s, pathological theories of black men and boys became normalized in white feminist analyses of rape and gender. Mm. In Second Assault, in The Second Assault, Joyce Williams and Karen Holmes develops a theory of racial uh, sexual stratification, which focuses on the intra-racial black male rapist. Williams and Holmes believe rape or the threat of rape mm -hmm. is an important tool of social control in a complex system of racial sexual stratification. Fear of rape keeps not only the female in her place, but fear of the accusation of rape, uh, raping a white woman, keeps minority males in their places as well. Mm. Right? Williams and Holmes, right? Uh, because there was uh, such a high cost involved with interracial inter rape, Williams and Holmes asserted that intraracial patterns of rape were used to, were used to by black men to assert their masculinity. Black where, men were not real. Where, where we heard that? Okay. Well, yeah. It, yeah, black black men were not real men and had no actual power. So in raping minority women, minority males frequently are doing no more than imitating the white male, like the subculture, subcultural violence. Right on nine, appreciate that support. Like the subcultural violence criminologists before them, Williams and Holmes asserted that black masculinity is compensatory and defined by its lack of real patriarchal manhood. While Williams and Holmes admit that there is no empirical evidence, mm. nor is there any empirical validation for either the myth of the black male, uh, the myth of black male sexuality mm. or that of sex as compensatory behavior, their theory of compensatory black masculinity and racial sexual stratification would come to define key aspects of intersectionality mm. and black feminist thought from the 1980s forward. Mm. Boom. This Can't is, get any clearer than that. No, this is exactly where the idea of the black mm -hmm. male rapist, the black male degenerate, you know, the, the, the black male who's imitating white men, it comes from racist white scholarship that had no empirical standing mm -hmm. and was appropriated by black feminist thought in the 1980s. And you, black macho, black macho, black macho and the myth of the superwoman and mm -hmm. used as truth, even though you had black women, even black women sociologists, you had Robert Staples, of course, you had black male sociologists. But you had black women sociologists who were refuting Michelle Wallace's work at the time, but the, none of those refute became structural as far as how black mm -hmm. feminism began to develop. Mm -hmm. They developed more off of these subculture of violence theoretical ideas that had no basis in reality. Mm -hmm. And this is the impact it, it, it continued to have on how black men are conceptualized to this day. Mm -hmm. Heterosexual black men in gender theory and you know gender studies, women and gender studies especially, are still perceived by this standard. Mm -hmm. This is still how we're perceived. 
let me see. Great I nine says uh, in the study, female labor participation in black and white, 1870 to 1970, we can see that black females and white females labor participation jumps from 20% before mid 1950 to 60%. While there's negative impact on black males. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank. Right. Okay. Um, let's see. Yeah, let's see. I'm, that, if, you, if you leave it up to me, I'm gonna end up reading the whole damn. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have permission. See, I, I, but, I, I, I didn't do it because the, I didn't have permission. But the, the thing is, the, the, the whole paper's fire. Ridiculously so. Do you think, Doc? Do you think? And I wish this was, I wish, man, I wish I was an undergrad student reading this. I wish it was available in that way because what we learned was, you know, uh, shout out to Joe for the, the cash app. Um, we, we, you know, we weren't given any of this. What we were told is, you know, a whole different, you know, narrative in and of itself. Um, but I'll share this last segment and then, uh, We'll get some feedback. So this is uh, part of the conclusion, right? The quest for women's rights in the United States originating in the 19th century writings of suffragists to the writings of black and white feminists in the mid 20th century relied on racist theories of white evolution and black savagery to explain the threats that a freed black male population posed not only to white women, but womankind. Kind, yes. Isn't that deep? Mm -hmm. Womankind. So this mm -hmm. universal sisterhood is characterized. The glue that holds it together mm. is the threat of black men. Say that for the people in the back, Doc. That's the core of it. The glue that holds this universal feminist sisterhood together. Going back to the writings of the actual feminists on the ground in the 19th and 20th centuries is the fear of black male savagery. The idea of the black male savage is what holds this the sisterhood together. Mm. This is what's key. That's powerful to me. Right? Even, even to the color purple, right? Oh, 1985, shit. right? Color purple. What 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 is the sisterhood's glue, right? The savagery and the rape, you know. I mean, you you all you have to do is watch the color purple, and all the all all these ideologies come together in that one simple movie. It was basically a public statement that we are women because black men mistreat us too. Mm -hmm. That's the narrative that it contributed to at that time. We need to be saved from the black male savage and his yes. childlike behavior and inability to actually become a patriarch, you know, a, a man, take care of his family and his abuse because he's too backward and too savage. Yes. We have to be rescued. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, again, you, you meld that. OK, so you have a film like that directed mm -hmm. by Steven Spielberg. Mm -hmm. Right. That's on the back of at least at that point, 20 years of policy. Mm -hmm. And you tell me what the women of that time who are primarily the heads of households in black communities and the boys and the girls growing up in those households, what do they reproduce when they have kids and families of their own? What do their kids reproduce that reaches the current moment? This is what we're talking about. When we look at the, the appropriation of civil rights by white feminism, it's mm -hmm. not just limited to civil rights. It has implications that impact the black family for decades to follow and still does. Mm hmm. I mean, when you talk about the gender war that we've been talking, it, this, it's it's been incredibly exacerbated by this period. This, if, if you want to talk about it from the eight, eight, you know, the the late nineteenth century or mid nineteenth century, right to now, this entire period is what creates this dynamic, right? And you talked about in the video, you covered a different part of the paper where he was talking about how the perception of black men pushed in popular culture became the perception that many men in internalized. Mm -hmm. Remember that? Yeah. You care to comment on that before I go further? Cause I think it's important to this. It's it, basically, you know, when, if you allow feminism in white feminism and it's all this racist undertones to actually take control of the, not only the popular narrative, but also the school system. Mm. 
This is being taught. Mm. It's being taught to black to, to black boys, because that you know because um, you know because because me being outside you know being older and 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 being uh, 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 in school before these policies were actually put into place, I can hear it come out of their voices, out of out of their mouths, mm -hmm. and their beliefs. Mm -hmm. That's it, and they don't have no idea where this stuff comes from. Right. Right. And then you get to you get to hip hop. And then you get to oh my god! And it, it, it's, it, it's, it's what I said. In other words, this 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 thug, this this black macho, uh, this criminal, this violent uh, behavior has been so popularized. It's been fed to us. We have no idea where this stuff comes from. Mm -hmm. it is because hip hop when it first came out was not that. Okay, it no. wasn't that when it first came out, right? No. Um, and you took a, a small segment of people. You know, in in drug dealing in drug culture, in gang and drug culture, being popularized, yeah, and becoming the the symbol. Basically, I mean, arguably, you tell me, Doc, it's become the symbol of black masculinity since the nineteen nineties. Well, it, it, what it's be, what it's become is another uh, phase of the same idea. It's almost mm -hmm. like these 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 ideas are updated, especially in popular culture, over time, because you could. You go to, I mean, you could take it to uh, Jack Johnson, the early part of the 20th century, and mm -hmm. all, and, and you can watch it take different forms. Hell, by the time you get to the 19th century, oh. Muhammad Ali and yeah. state that support, K. Ron. Um, yeah, you could take it up to Muhammad Ali and the threat of Ali. Yep. You know, Michael just, Mack. Yeah, Michael Mack. But not just physically, the threat mm -hmm. of Ali as an athlete and and who has a mind, right? He's an mm -hmm. activist in a particular way. Malcolm X, yes. But also, you know, you could take it up through uh, the the uh, the uh, uh, the film oh, era, black, black sport, black sport, black exploitation, the black exploitation mm -hmm. era. You can the, take it the, up through there. The pimps and the pimps and the and the, uh, and the drug dealers, yeah, well, absolutely. And mm -hmm. then follow that up. By the time you get to the end of the seventies, push forward a decade, and now you got the, you got hip hop that mm -hmm. seems to reiterate the same ideas. But we're not going to look at the white institutions. That play a role in getting to decide which images and which uh, types mm -hmm. of artists and songs make it to the public. We're mm -hmm. not going to talk about that. But you mm -hmm. have this cherry-picked representation of black men that seems to be consistent, right? With 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 ethnologists from the 19th century, with with pundits and political uh, you know figures in the 20th century who are all predicating their ideas on the subculture of violence theory. So these pop culture representations reflect all these same ideas, and we think it's you know it, it just comes out of nowhere. You look at look at Empire, the, the scene where uh, uh, what's his name puts his gay son into the trash can. Oh, I didn't even see that. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it doesn't stop. Let me, it, so I'm gonna I'm gonna finish this paragraph, especially for those of us uh, for those on uh, Inner Light, so you guys can hear this because I think it's incredibly important. Um, it says, despite decades of scholarship illuminating the relationship that feminism and the political struggle for women's rights has to anti-Black racism, colonial conquest, and classism, present-day scholars are met with opprobrium and sanction when attempting to discuss the limits and harms of American feminism. Mm. Academic discussions of white feminism's racism are permitted if feminism itself is not questioned. When feminism's racism is framed as a question of inclusion or white women's failure to include uh, the black and other non-white women's experiences, the history of feminism as a movement for the freedom and liberation of women across the world remains intact. From this perspective, the historical movement and political aims of feminism were not incorrect or malicious, merely non-inclusive and incomplete. However, when feminism is interpreted as a historical dynamic that set itself against black civil rights and deliberately campaigned for the elimination and lethal targeting mm. of black men over a century, such conversations are often outright dismissed within the academy. Mm. Mm. Damn it. The history of feminism's racism reveals an insidious program of social control and political deflection that inhibited black civil and human rights. Despite this history, academic theory proceeds as if feminism is largely compatible with the goals of racial equality and democratic progress in the United States. The fear of black male militancy and the encroachment of racial equality saw white feminist theory embrace an insidious form 
of racist criminology that viewed the poverty of Black people and the sexual insatiability of Black men to be incompatible with the safety and economic progress of white women in the United States. Mm. Further research is needed to assess the impact that American feminism's anti-Black male rhetoric and theories have had on the economic, political, and cultural development of Black America. Damn it. Uh, and, and, uh, basically, man, in other words, you're saying is that from the very beginning, feminism's uh, opponent was not white men. It was actually black men. It Absolutely. has been from the very beginning. Absolutely. So what happens when you entice a gender demographic in the black community to join you if mm -hmm. this is really what feminism is? Right. If it's presented mm -hmm. as benign and it's just a universal sisterhood, we understand that narrative. But if it's actually, as he puts it, um, uh, where did, I, I want to get that quote because I just saw it. Um, and, uh, you know, if it if it embraced an insidious form of racist criminology that mm. viewed the poverty of black people and the sexual insatiability of black men to be incompatible with the safety and economic progress of white women in the U.S., if that's actually what feminism is, mm -hmm. then what is the impact of in, of incorporating over half the black community, be it through policy or through pure ideology. What happens? What mm. happens to the black family? What happens to, to, you know, the idea of blackness in and of itself? How do these things impact black folk? And civil rights in this, in this dynamic might as well be, um, you know, a, a, a figurative representation of black politics or black political struggle in general. Because mm. one of the things we've seen shift from civil rights and black power in the 1970s to post 2015 is the black feminization of, of black politics. But if mm. that feminization is rooted in this historical idea of black men as propagated by white feminists, then can we understand how black men are perceived and treated even when it seems like they're being advocated for? You got movements that are talking about the deaths of black men, but those same movements. Appreciate that, Uru. Those same movements that are advocating Motown. Appreciate that. The, the same, and, and I should also say, um, appreciate Master Bastard for your cash up. Those same movements that are uh, that are seemingly advocating for dead black men, murdered mm. black men, are still telling black men they can't take any leadership. In mm -hmm. their organization. What the mm -hmm. fuck are we talking about? What are we talking about? Mm. And when none of those policies produce anything that helps black males. Mm -hmm. What are we talking about? When you can raise $90 million in one year. And nothing comes out of it that actually benefits the people that you're supposed to be targeting. For being, for being uh, unjustly treated. What are we talking about? Who's this supposed to benefit? What is this? Well, what what did uh, uh, what is it? The comedian say this need to be studied by generals Man. to psychologically reframe this whole movement or this whole uh, ideology as something that's benign and helpful toward black people and black men. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can't, you can't make this up. You just basically did a psychological coup. Yeah. A whole entire people. But the implications of it, even materially, are ridiculous. I mean, you guys know the reports just came out this week. Or, no, nah, I shouldn't say that. There's an article that came out this week. We've known about this for a while. But in regard to BLM, mm. how many millions of dollars are unaccounted for in terms of who actually administrates that? Mm. Right? Nobody seems to know. Right. We were told a couple of years ago this was the new evolution of political, you know, political uh, protests um, and political goings ons in the black community because you have no central leadership. There's no hierarchy. Everything is everything. Everybody's there. Mm -hmm. OK. Right. Millions of dollars later, don't nobody know where the money is. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about the movement of people on the ground who want to push to advance, uh, you know, moving black folk from a from a space of being unjustly treated, most particularly. And I'm unashamed in saying black men, right, moving to a space of, of, of just treatment. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the appropriation of that movement 
by an entity that's well-financed and fixated on policies that are rooted in what Dr. Curry is talking about in this goddamn paper. The impact of that to the point where we're seeing more money raised in just a few years than I've ever heard raised by any black activist organization, ever. No policies to show for it. Nothing targeting black males who are the victims that are used to, to, to pull together these movements in the first place. And if anything, as I reported on last year, a witch hunt to make sure that the that the specific BLM uh, the groups that actually do get some funding do not have black men, most particularly heterosexual black men in positions of leadership. Hey, Shay, how you doing, lady? Right. This is what I'm talking about. As, as Uru says, everybody but black men. How does that work? Well, this paper explains how the logic of it works. And this is one of the reasons, man, I was really grateful. Because even though I was reading the paper, mm -hmm. it, it never dawned on me, um, you know, to... to to engage it publicly I, on YouTube, I was just reading it. You know, it's like, hey, this mm -hmm. is dope. When I saw you post it, I said, you know what? He's absolutely right. We need to get this out. So, understand this is a part two. If you haven't seen part one, uh, you definitely need to go to BGS Books. Uh, that's the channel, and look mm -hmm. for how white feminists stole civil rights. <laughs> the original, I think, it's less than fifteen minutes, where he kind of goes through the paper. This is a part two to that. You should watch both. But I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I just wanted, you know, I, you know, because I thought it when I read it, I thought it was so important that we need to. We actually accepted all this stuff without questioning it. Mm. And I think whether you agree with it or disagree with it, you need to examine exactly what it actually is instead of what we believe that it is, what we're actually fed. Mm. Because the results are actually plain. Okay, mm -hmm. feminism does not help black women at all. And the little crumbs that they get only uh, help a, a small portion of the black women. Mm. And it does nothing for your sons. It does nothing for your men. And why black women are, are continually okay with that? They have black men scratching their heads. You, you're actually doing nothing. You're complaining about the family, complaining about the black society, complaining about the community, but you actually do nothing to actually help your men that could help you. And it doesn't make sense over the past 60, 70 years. It doesn't make sense. Until you start reading this stuff and said, okay, this is not at you at all. What you believe is not what you really believe at all. You're being fed to this by your betters. And have been for 150 years. Mm -hmm. you, you, you are still, if I dare say it, you are still the white woman's step stool. Her, the white woman's handmaiden. Well, this is the two-pronged assault of that, right? Because mm -hmm. at the same time, you have an agenda put forth where black men are supposed to, if they want to be rewarded by the larger society, they're supposed to emulate the ideas that the white community has about black men. And, that, and that's your ticket to advancement, right? If you, if you either act it out on screen or if you're an mm -hmm. academic, if you advocate for those ideas that fundamentally dehumanize black men, your mm -hmm. career will advance. Right, exactly. So that's the male component of that two-pronged assault. You're rewarded in society if you're able to either act these out on screen in music or advocate for it in, in, on academic grounds in, within the academy. And for women, everything we just talked, everything you just said, that's the two-pronged assault. Mm -hmm. And we go for it. And one of the things that Black men are actually fighting against right now, intra-racially, Mm -hmm. is that we are not this this construction that comes out of 19th century or uh, uh, yeah uh, 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 19th century uh, ethnology. We are not the construction that they say we are. We actually have to have that fight within our own communities, mm -hmm. even though every day you see black men who are working, who are, are taking care of, who are loving, who are supporting, who are doing daily things as any other group would, of supporting its own, we completely eliminate that and go for the idea we've been fed about Black men. 
to the point where you have black men who are just literally hell if even just going monk let's just take that what does it say when you have eligible young even well-employed black men who are walking away from all of it mm. just because they're tired of being told that this is who they are this subculture of violence idea is who black men fundamentally are we hear it from white society we hear it intraracially within black communities hell you hear it in the classroom mm. speak on it the university you're paying to go to mm. from black professors that look like your mother Mm. Wow. Where do you go from there? Especially if nobody wants to hear you say what you're trying to say. And worse off, when you don't have the vocabulary to say it. Mm. You, you, you're, you're Neo taking those blue pills in the last matrix to keep you sedated. Yeah. To keep you busy. Actually constructing the, the new matrix. Constructing That's what you're doing. Matrix. Sure. Mm-hmm. And you're, and you're sitting in a classroom with a professor who's studied way more than you have, or at least you think, mm -hmm. in a position of authority. And then they're, and I've had this happen, even in graduate school, where they're sitting there telling you, well, black men don't care about families. Mm -hmm. And this is a black professor at Temple University. He doesn't get any, well, at least I didn't think he got any blacker than that. But when you're hearing that kind of thing, coming from the people that you think are about liberation and you're sitting in those classrooms there to learn so that you can help your own community, but you have to hear that you're not worthy of the community you're a part of. If, and if anything, you are the bane of its existence. Mm -hmm. Not white society. You as you. black men. You. Yes. Yeah. And you know, and you, you are not worthy to be, they're, you know, they're, that's where the contempt comes from because they've been fed that a black man is not worthy of being the, the partner, husband, spouse of, of black women. Mm -hmm. That's where it comes from. Mm -hmm. They've been fed this for 150 years. And, and, and even though they, on the ground, they know it's not true, but guess what? It's being so indoctrinated into the culture, they have no choice but to believe it or feel it. They don't even think it, they feel it. And black yeah. men see it come out constantly yeah absolutely absolutely and it just it, it, you know there's a i'm gonna see if i can find it well, well niggas can't die fast enough oh man bullet bags mm -hmm. that's what we're, we're we're bullet bags i'm like are you serious this is how black men are represented and black men, just like and black women, just like just as white women see black men as an impediment to their uh, ascension, mm. I think black women have in, in actually imbibed the same thing. Black men are an impediment. If we could just get different men, wow, we could ascend. And you wow. hear it all the time, politically, you know, you over the you know the last three four years. Uh, with, with, as, as black women have started to ascend politically, who's the who's the people holding them back mm. in their minds? It's not white men. Mm. Who's holding them back? Black men. Y'all need to get your know, y'all niggas get, need to get in line and and, and fall in line and and um, stop uh, stop uh, preventing us from actually uh, getting to a better place Ascent, to ascending. It, man. There's a. I'm trying to, Robert, appreciate that support. Um, what is that? Um, can't get across. Can't get across half court without some uh, <laughs> D speak, uh, but but none of it uh, a, a dollar wise. It's about us. Yeah. Yeah. This I remember. Uh, Hearing this uh, years ago uh, for the first time, it was an interview, and and I didn't understand what about it impacted me. But I think what it was was it was the first time I had heard in popular media a black woman talking about reconciling on some level, not at all arguing that what I'm about to play is perfect or fits everything or answers all. The, but at the end of the day. Mm -hmm addressing 
the perception of black men and really coming to grips with with the misrepresented aspect of it. So I'm gonna share just a little piece of it. Some of many of you have probably seen this. This is a conversation that's taking place between Maya Angelou and Common being interviewed. Uh, actually, I didn't hit the sound. Let me hit the. I'm 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 learning from my mistakes, sir. <laughs> I have we all, a video we, with no we, sound. We all do. <laughs> Captain Cisco, I love the name uh, and the icon. Appreciate that support. Um, let's see if this if I, if I've queued it up uh, right. Let me get some sound on here. What would you suggest to these Ah, people? but I know what I did not do right. <laughs> uh, let me get the proper sound setting put in. These are the little things that uh, I think you have together. But, all right, so let me see if that's any better. Young black men do. Well, this. Oh, he asked the question. Uh, what would you suggest that you, these young black men do? And he's asking Maya Angelou. Well, let's see what she said. It's going to sound very strange since I've never been asked that question, that particular question before. I would ask the young black men to forgive themselves. You see, we were sold and bought together, black men, African men and women. We were dragged along the sandy beaches in chains together. Black men, African men could not reach over and, and protect their women. And they began to feel unmanly. And the black women began to feel, you didn't even protect me. And so the whole, this is gone from 1619 to 2011, with black men feeling I'm not, I wasn't capable of protecting you from slavery. So I must not be all that such a much. So my real virgin, uh, fertility, my real strength is in my crotch, not in my mind or in my arms. You see, I would like black men to forgive themselves. They didn't own the rifles. They didn't have the guns, you see. Right. And to be a man in this time, be present in this time. Yes. I'm going to move along. Okay. I, I, now, I want to be clear about something. When I first saw this, because I think this was, well, this particular video is uh, 11 years old, and I can mm -hmm. swear I saw it prior to that. But let's just take it at 11 years. At the time, I was there's something about this that impacted me, and I realized in hindsight what it was. I was conflicted because in one sense, she's continuing the narrative mm -hmm. in a way that situates black men seeing themselves as nothing more than their crotch, as opposed right. to how society sees black men and that black men still saw themselves as human beings to stop, despite not being treated as such. So mm -hmm. that, that, you know, that part bothered me. But at the same time, the part that got to me in, in a sense was that she was actually telling black women in one vein, that you got to start seeing black men through different eyes. And in mm -hmm. some respects, she's actually pushing back a little bit against the subculture of violence theory by humanizing black men and suggesting that they didn't have the political power to act out as white men. And if that's the mm. standard that mm -hmm. black women have when measuring black manhood, mm -hmm. then they are, they, then they are participating in his underdevelopment. That's, that's part of, so what she's doing is both mixed with problems and yet there's also a grain of intention to uplift and all of that is kind of mixed together and the first time i saw this i was moved conflicted and pissed off all at the same time and i didn't know why mm. but when you actually visit you know curry's assessment of subcultural violence theory when you visit his work looking at early feminism you can see in which you can see the ways in which somebody like her mm -hmm. a feminist advocating for black women is both propagating the very problematic ideas we're fighting against while at the same time grappling with trying to humanize black men to other black women. And I'm not saying that for the entirety of her career. I'm just talking about this interview, right? But this is what it produces. It produces these kind of mixed situations where black men, whether you're sitting in classrooms, whether you're watching TV or having a conversation, 
you, 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 you're getting this mixture of a beautifully cooked meal and bile served to you on the same damn plate mm. and trying to make sense of what the hell has been put before you. Mm -hmm. It's still framed in the same uh, um, is the same frame that has been laid out to us, you know, since uh, Staten Katie. Same framework. Yeah. So in other words, she's not thinking outside of the, the framework that she was given. Exactly. Even in that. Exactly. And, exactly. and she's projecting how black men see themselves that we can protect, protect them. Mm hmm. Or we couldn't be as because we couldn't be the white man with the guns and the rifles. OK. Mm -hmm. In other words, she was saying that uh, even that even at that, you're still not a man because uh, even though it's not your fault, you're still not a man. Yeah. And how many black men continue to die protecting their own? Mm -hmm. and how that doesn't become part of the narrative. Right. So, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. But man, look. The only way you can get through this is John Henry yourself through it and sacrifice yourself on, 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 on uh, two black, two white supremacy to as a sacrifice to get your people out of this, and that's what they still want. Mm -hmm. It's the only way you can, you know, uh, like the Mandalorian, right? Did you take off your helmet? Yes. The only way you can actually uh, be absolved of your sin is. Is, is 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 washed into a lake in other words a lake of blood you still have to come back and sacrifice yourself right right to actually achieve your manhood instead and of through your groin yeah and, and 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 in order to really achieve the greatest example of it you still need to fall on your sword mm -hmm. but not ask any questions relevant to how people perceive you and treat you and how that's evolved and expanded over time Right. But I just wanted to really, in that respect, I wanted to, to pay some homage, to Dr. Curry, um, mm -hmm. courageous work he's doing. Mm -hmm. um, I want to. And, and, and this goes with uh, many of my black male stu studies brothers who I tip my hat to for continuing this work and helping to build on the, 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 this this approach that has you know been needed for so long. Uh, I want to shout them out. I want to support that. Um, you know, especially to my nearest brothers, uh, brothers like yourself, you know, and, and in the academy, shout out to my boy, Dr. Ronald Neal, my boy, Gigi, Green Gorilla, support their channels if you haven't. I shouldn't have to tell you to support BGS Ibmore, but also support BGS Books and uh, the, the Black Gnostic channel. Uh, what's the official name of it? Uh, 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 the the uh, <laughs> the Black Pill Gnostic Channel, Black Pill Gnostic uh, Channel, the Black Pill Gnostic Channel, and the uh, and BGS Books and BGS Books. Yes, support those channels. Definitely watch part one, or I'm gonna call it. I'm appropriating. I'm calling. It part <laughs> one. I'm calling this one part two. Uh, I did not ask for permission, but uh, you know I got to do that because again, I was I was so glad that you did it. I was so glad that you did it, man. And I shout out to you for doing that. Um, I appreciate that. But any thoughts, any closing thoughts before we close out? I mean, you know, um, you know, I, I'm a layman and, and, and um, layman can say anything, have any kind of opinions, write anything. And it's uh, I don't take the same kind of penalty, say, like an academic like you would, because you're actually flying in the face of 150 years of narrative, especially white feminist narrative. And it takes it takes it takes a certain amount of courage of, of intellectual courage that should do something like this so i applaud dr kerr i actually applaud i actually give, gave dr clary a slow clap at the end of the, yeah, of the piece I heard that. <laughs> yeah i heard that because i know I, I, because there's going to be you know there, there's going to be repercussions for actually putting this piece out i know there will be hmm. and he accepted that yeah. right i give him uh kudos for the for his academic courage and trust and believe you know, you're in you're in that realm okay it takes a lot of courage to actually do this well, he, he positioned himself in, in such a way where uh, mm -hmm. he can he can withstand it. Uh, but like I said, uh, if you haven't seen it, this is uh, this is uh, what I'm calling part one. BGS Books is the channel. How White mm -hmm. Feminists Stole Civil Rights. You can check that out. See BGS Books right there in the search. Uh, you know, subscribe to the channel, support. You know, so we can continue to develop this. We're not arguing that this is the end of a discussion. In many respects, what black male studies is doing is part of a continuum 
of uh, work that's actually been done um, by different figures over different time periods, but we're adding to that. We're adding to the legacy of that and pushing it further, right? And in, and, and at all instances, highlighting the humanity of black men and not contributing mm -hmm. to this narrative that underdevelops black men and justifies it with feminist mythology, white supremacist mythology, any such, anything of the like. Yeah, yeah. So and the fact, the, the fact that they admitted that this is a myth. Yeah, the very framers, very uh, authors of this myth admitted there's no basis for it. Mm. And basically, women, our women, all women uh, accept this hook, line and sinker like it's like it's a fact. And we'll fight you. Well, and you made a point in your original video that I want to make sure we echo here when you talked about uh, the, the real push in the 1980s in popular culture. This idea is black men as abusers and rapists. Yes. The ways in which you know uh, white women and white uh, white women and black women, you know, internalize this readily mm -hmm. because they had been primed for it. Feminism has been pro you know, proposing this since the 19th century. So you know, by the time it comes around in the 1980s, it's it's you know, it goes down smooth <laughs> for them, right? But he, I, but I can tell you, being a little kid watching the color purple, I did not have the vocabulary to say what I was feeling, to say what I was what I was sensing. I didn't have the wherewithal. Hell, to be honest with you, I didn't have it, uh, you know, going through my doctorate. I didn't have the means. And so this is just now really being developed in a very particular way to respond to an era that hasn't been properly responded to mainly because academics in particular, but intellectuals in general, even activists, are punished if they try and bring this up. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you, Brother BGS. Appreciate you uh, being willing to dive into this for a second time. Um, and, and again, you know, he, he did it with no notice. I just asked him, you know, I think about, you know, 60 seconds before the show. <laughs> <I'm doing> Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> nah, not, at least gave him a day, but still, that's not a lot of, <laughs> not a lot of space. So I really appreciate you being that, do, doing that, and being willing to provide that support um, in this space, because we got to be able to push our arguments to another level using data, using uh, accurate historical information to better frame what it is uh, we identify the problems to be, and thus what the solution should be. So thank you. Yeah. In other words, you know the. Uh Black ministry is going to get mainstream and we have to be ready. Our arguments have to be solid and tight. And this is just part of the process. Yeah. So you can find this paper. I think it's academia. Um, uh, let's see. Is it .com or .edu? I think it's .com. But you can find it on academia.com. Or, uh, or you can go to uh, uh, you actually go to Dr. Curry's Twitter. Okay. And get you the link. Up there? Yeah. Okay. Beautiful. Uh, and check it out from there. But anyway, appreciate you, brother. I'm going to take you down. I'm going to close out. All right. Uh, all right. So, peace. Anyway, welcome, welcome back, Hassan. I'm glad to see he made an appearance. You go. <laughs> <laughs> I've been coming out this whole week. But anyway. <laughs> yeah, get out of here. I'm going to go get in this bathtub. But anyway. <laughs> Right, you, 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 your, your uh, Jedi meditation chamber, huh? Yeah, man. Yeah, mm. man. <laughs> well, what, what is it? What is going to be on the uh, playlist tonight, sir? Oh man, I told you, I, I'm, I'm watching a real good movie, so uh, okay. I'm gonna hit you to it uh, in a minute. But yeah, man, I'm about to go do this. But appreciate you coming in, man. Let me, let me go ahead and close this out. Okay. Um, shout out to all of you that support Uru. You know, I always love when you come through, brother. Thanks for coming through, Hybrid. Um, appreciate it, you know, appreciate all you brothers in here supporting through the comment section, as well as those who are communicating through innerlightradio.com. Uh, shout out to brother Jamal, but at the end of the day, uh, let's keep this work going. Let's keep pushing. Um, and let's keep challenging ourselves with, um, the, you know, the desire to pull in accurate information to craft better arguments so we can really, um, improve the lives of black boys and black men, right? So much appreciation for y'all support tonight. Y'all have a good one. Peace.
I am here to tell you, brothers, we are not criminals by birth, perennial rapists, incapable intellects, man children, sperm donors, child support wellsprings, success objects, walking phalluses, ATM machines, lottery tickets, unintelligent henchmen, valueless assassins, pro bono mercenaries, unpaid bodyguards, interchangeable stepfathers, child discipline proxies, unpaid repairmen, workhorses, emotional tampons, or any other socially accepted dehumanizing stereotype. We are thinkers, inventors, innovators, leaders, fathers, and men. Embrace your humanity, know your worth, and extend your time, attention, and resources only to those who genuinely respect you. And remember, your worth is not defined by meeting other people's narcissistic and selfish and unrealistic needs. You define your worth. Peace. Let's